Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this session on our uh, plastics. This is a session which we have um, been absolutely delighted to be involved in. My name is Jessica Hickey. I work at the Environment Agency in the UK. Uh, this session has been put together by my team, the Plastic Sustainability Team for the Environment Agency, in collaboration with the University of Hull um, and um, Ocean Cleanup, and uh, also HR Wallingford in the UK. It's been an incredible journey, and what we try to do at this session is something a little bit different to what EGU has been, has been used to, and we're really, really grateful about all the support that we've had from the EGU committee in making this session actually happen, and we're so pleased to see so many of you here. What we wanted to do at the EGU was to take the opportunity to really communicate not just the science about plastics in the environment, but also the wide aspect and the social aspect, because we're in the middle of this really incredible and really exciting phase in society where we're shifting how we perceive plastics, how we use plastics, and perhaps what is normal now probably won't be in the next few years' time. And you as scientists are a really, really big part of that. Part of what we need to be doing in the role that I'm in it for the Environment Agency is making sure we have the right evidence to support the, where we need these changes to happen, and that's where you come in. So we really urge you, if you have the opportunity, to be looking at how plastics can inform those research gaps that we have, particularly in microplastics, then please think about engaging with that. So we have some incredible speakers for you today. Uh, we're trying to tell the whole story about plastics. We're doing it through almost a storytelling theme. That's our aim. And we're going to be starting off with somebody who is certainly um, not new to the EGU. In fact, in the, uh, 2016, he won the Outstanding uh, Scientist for EGU Award. Um, so, and some of you may have already seen him this morning in the plastic session. Um, so we're going to start off our session by thinking about or explaining where in the oceans we might be finding plastics. And I'd like to welcome the stage, please, Eric van Sever. Yes, great to see so many of you here. Um, plastic, I am going to set the scene and kind of get a, a hand on what we know and particularly what we don't know about all this plastic in the ocean. For those of you who were there already at the, um, at the, the session that we had this morning, there was lots of uh, fantastic talks about all the unknowns that are there. And it is somewhat remarkable that even for a field that is so much in the public attention, that there's so much science still that needs to be done. But I think that is also the opportunity. Because I think that the plastic in our ocean is not only a, um, an, an environmental problem and something that we absolutely need to take care of. It is also something that actually changes the way that we look at the ocean itself. You know, I'm an oceanographer. And oceanographers, we like to draw arrows. We like to do very complicated stuff on maps where we draw arrows and different currents, and you can see the western boundary currents here, you can see the flow around Antarctica, you can see all these complicated flow patterns. And as oceanographers, we then uh, pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, aren't we smart and aren't we complicated with all those flow patterns? Well, for the last few years or so, it's become more and more apparent that even these flow patterns are far, far too simplistic. The ocean circulation itself is far more complex than what you could ever put on a map like this. And one way just to quickly highlight that to you, how complex the flow is, is by showing an, an, an experiment that we did when we went uh, down to Antarctica with Chris Turney, who's here, who's here in the audience. Um, went down to Antarctica on the Schokalski, and um, we did a, a, an experiment there where we released pairs of drifting buoys. So here you see myself standing on the stern of a ship. This was not in the Antarctic. I'm wearing shorts. It was uh, near the Bahamas. But the same kind of thing happened there. In Antarctica, we released pairs of buoys into the ocean. And these buoys, they have a GPS tracker. They have a satellite communication device. So we can track them in real time as they are moving through the ocean water. Now, the key thing is that every time we did those 10 points that you see there, there were actually two buoys. There were 15 meters or so apart from each other because they were thrown into the ocean at exactly the same time but on opposite sides of the ship. Now, the ocean current then takes them along and this is what that looks like. What you see is that 
Initially, all the buoys go eastward, as you would expect, and as was also drawn on this map, the eastward flow around Antarctica. But already quickly, you see that those buoys, they start to separate out. They start to diverge. They start to disperse, as we say. And they get into these very, very complex patterns, um, all the eddies that are going on there. You see that the buoys that started 15 meters apart, we're now 40 days in or so, and most of them are already more than 100 kilometers apart. The scale of this uh, map, by the way, is roughly 500 kilometers or so, just to give you a feeling for how quickly this goes. So the ocean is inherently chaotic. The ocean is inherently, if you start um, two, two pieces of plastic pretty close to each other, then at some point you have no idea of knowing where they come, um, came from anymore as was also shown in a nice talk this morning by my student. But we can model this. We can say something about how ocean currents, to the best of what we know about the ocean currents, how they move plastic around. And that we do with these kind of global simulations. So, th so this is a type of global simulation that I and my lab do. We, we take high-resolution ocean model. And with high resolution here, we mean eight, uh, eight kilometers or so, global scale. This is really state of the art um, at the moment. And in that ocean model, everywhere where it's ocean, we put one particle. And we just track that along with the ocean flow. And that looks something like this. So you see that the equator very quickly um, cleans up of plastic. There's upward upwelling of water on the equator, so uh, the plastic moves away from there. There's upwelling in the Southern Ocean, so the plastic moves away from there. And all the plastic converges in these areas in the mid-latitude bands over, oh, well, you can't see my point yet. Well, um, around 30 south and around 30 north. These are called the garbage patches. These bands are where the three-dimensional ocean flow essentially converges on the surface. So there's upwelling on the equator and in the Southern Ocean and in the, in the Arctic, and then there's downwelling in the, in the mid-latitudes, and that is what causes the plastic to accumulate. The water downwells, but the plastic uh, can't downwell with it, so it stays behind. I've once on BBC Radio 5 called this the turd that won't flush. That's kind of the idea. So this is a, a model still, of course, it's a, it's, it's a simulation of reality, but we do know that these garbage patches, that they actually exist. People who go out and who measure plastic in the, in the ocean, the, 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 the workhorse that we have are these things shown here on the right. They're manta trolls, and they are trolled behind a ship for uh, one nautical mile, typically. They have a mesh size of 330 micrometers, so one-third of a millimeter. And if they're trolled through the ocean for a nautical mile, then at the end they are um, inverted, they're cleaned out, and all the pieces of plastic that stayed behind in a net are then counted. Normally that's what we have students to do, right? Um, so these, these, these pieces of plastic are then there, and, and because we know how long it's gone through the ocean, we know the width of the net, we can convert this to number of pieces of plastic per square kilometer floating on the surface of the open ocean. And a really nice study um, is here on the, on, on the left, where Cara Lavender Law and her team at SEA, um, they, they, they collected something like 6,000 or so of these sample of these manta trolls in the North Pacific. So you can see the US here and, and, and Mexico in gray for your, for your orientation if you're a land-based um, earth scientist. Well, the coloring here is the amount of plastic particles in the ocean from these manta trolls. And blue means essentially there was hardly any plastic in the ocean. Going to yellow, red, and purple, meaning more than 500,000 pieces per square kilometer. And you see indeed that there's this very clear bullseye, this, this great Pacific garbage patch um, between Hawaii and California. The black and gray lines are different models that were published before, that also ex tried to, to get the extent of, of the garbage patches. And you see that depending on exactly how you define the highest concentration, these, these models do a pretty good job in actually um, figuring out where or, or what, what the, 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 the geographical uh, position of the garbage patches. 
So we know that there are garbage patches, not only in the North Pacific, they've also been found in the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, South Pacific. The Indian Ocean is a bit more tricky. There probably isn't really a garbage patch there because it is so leaky ocean, but that, you know, that's the, the topic of another talk, I guess. Um, so, so they're there. There are garbage patches in the ocean. The question then, of course, is, well, what, what really is a garbage patch? And many people, when they first think of a garbage patch, they think of, of something like this, right? And, and big stuff floating around. You don't want to know how often people have asked me whether I've stood on the garbage patches. As if it's some kind of island that you can plant a flag on, right? But this is not the garbage patch. This is not even the plastic problem, I would argue. This is a ghost net. It is indeed photographed in the North Pacific, in the area of the, of the garbage patch. It's an abandoned fishing net, and it is an environmental disaster on its own right. These ghost nets are absolutely horrendous because they catch fish and they, um, they create gigantic bycatch and, and, and kill. Um, but it's not, of course, why we all care about our uh, recyclable cups, right? It's a completely different problem. So this is not the mental image that you should have with a garbage patch. I would argue that a much better mental image of the garbage patch is this one. This is the content of one of the very first manta trolls taken exactly in that spot in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch of Hawaii. Um, it comes from Charles Moore paper, and it shows the content of one of those trolls. Now, you can see here a Bottle cap ring, probably, over here. Maybe a piece of straw, some line. But most of the pieces of plastic are very, very small. They're completely unidentifiable anymore. They're very small. Um, many of them you can't even see with your naked eye anymore. Now, if you carefully count those, the student's task, and we know how many there are in the nets, we can convert this to a number of pieces of plastic per square kilometer. And indeed, if you do that, you get to something like 900,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer. And that sounds a lot, until, of course, you realize that there's a million square meter in a square kilometer. So even here, in the middle of the North Pacific garbage patch, if you troll a net through the ocean, then you end up with one piece of plastic per square meter a tiny piece of plastic per square meter. Now, people often talk about the plastic soup, right? This, this idea that the whole ocean is filled with plastic, and it's, I would say it's much more a plastic bouillon. It's very thin and very, very few pieces of very small plastic floating around. Now, the question is then, of course, okay, so how much plastic is that then? How much of this plastic is floating around in the ocean? And to that effect, um, I led a team a few years ago that did a very big study all together um, to amass as many of the surface troll uh, experiments as we, as we could possibly get our hands on. And we got to a total of 11,000 of those surface troll points. You see them here on the map. And you see that there's quite some variability, both in the coverage, Apparently, people who track plastic like to go to the North Pacific and North Atlantic, and they hardly ever go to the Southern Hemisphere still. Um, but also in terms of the, uh, the order of magnitude. See here that the, the, the color scale is logarithmic. So even two points fairly close together could be orders of magnitude different amounts of plastic. And I think that one of our big knowledge gaps that we still have is to understand what sets this heterogeneity. What sets the spatial variation on scales of a few kilometers? Um, why is the plastic so different in all these areas? But anyway, with this, uh, this data in hand and some modeling and some statistics and some regression analysis, we were in the end able to get to a series of maps. A series of maps of what was our, at the time, best estimate of how much plastic is floating around on the surface of the ocean. And we ended up with, this was one of them. It was actually the highest estimate. Um, and this gives you, per location, how much floating plastic is, uh, is, is floating at the surface of the ocean. Anything that, that can fit in a manta troll. So you see, again, the North Pacific garbage patch showing up. 
You also see very high concentrations around Southeast Asia. You see shockingly high concentrations in the Mediterranean, actually. And there's good news in the Southern Ocean and also around the tropical Pacific where there's actually fairly low concentration still. Now, once you get to a map like this, then it's actually not too difficult to just sum this all up and to get to one overarching number. Now, we did all the analysis of the, of the confidence bounds. We used three different models, not only this one. Um, and when we did that, we got to confidence bounds that gave us this. The total amount of what we call small floating plastic um, on the surface of the ocean is 15 to 51 trillion pieces, weighing between 93 and 236,000 metric tons. The first time that we saw this number, we were in shock. We were in shock because this number is far, far, far too low. It is too low because we also have other estimates of how much plastic actually goes into the ocean. We don't have too many of those estimates, but by far the, the best one or the, 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 the most reputable one of those is by, um, by Jenna Jambak, who did um, a careful analysis in science of how much plastic enters the ocean from all the, the, um, the ocean-bound countries around the world. And she came up with, well, the, the number is often reported at 8 million metric tons. Nowadays, you sometimes even hear 10 million metric tons. I'd rather stay the, physic, uh, the, the physical scientist here and go with her lowest confident bound, which is 5 million metric tons. But in any case, let's use these two numbers and let's put them together. We know that there's not much more than 250,000 metric tons of plastic floating on the surface of the ocean. And on the other hand, there's at least 5 million metric tons entering the ocean every single year. Every single year, 20 times more plastic enters the ocean than is floating at the surface of the ocean right now. And this goes on year after year after year after year. I would argue that we really only need know of 1% of the plastic where it is now. We have proper maps of where the plastic of the ocean is for only 1% of it. 99% of the plastic in the ocean we have no idea where it is. We have dark plastic, right? Except for that every time that we probe, every time that we go out and, and, and try and, 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 and uh, find plastic, we do find it. Being a plastic scientist is one of the easiest um, lines of research in the world now because you just go out to sea and you will find plastic. People that go and sample the ocean floor, either the sediments in the ocean floor or with remote, um, uh, with, you know, with cameras and uh, ROVs, they very typically find plastic. It's now even found in a water column. Um, people who find, who, who, who sample water at, at um, 400 meter depth, they find plastic there. We saw a great talk this morning by Richard Lampett about that. All of you, if you've ever gone to the coastline, if you've ever gone to the beach and looked very carefully, of course you would have found plastic. And there are now hundreds and hundreds of, of, of organisms that actually have plastic in their stomach, that are reported to, on a large scale, have plastic in their stomach. So we know that there's plastic in all of these other reservoirs. The problem is that we have absolutely no idea how much is in each of those reservoirs let alone that we know how it moves between the reservoirs or, even more important probably, how it is distributed between, within the reservoirs. So three-dimensional maps. Now this figure, I think I can say it here among friends, this was figure one of my ERC starting grant proposal. And essentially I promised the ERC that I would solve this puzzle. And that's why we started um, the, the Topios project, tracking of plastics in our seas. So the idea is to, to, get, to, to, to get a handle on where all this other 99% plastic is. Um, how much is on the seafloor, how much is on the coastline. And for that we are making a three-dimensional flow model where we really track 
plastic as it moves between all the different compartments, where we track it as it fragments, where we track it as it biofiles, where we track it as it is moved by the waves and as it is beached on the coastline. Um, and all of that, then, we compare to observations, we compare to lab experiments, um, we parameterize um, to figure out uh, and, and to get the rate functions, to figure out what the rates, for instance, of fragmentation are, to figure out what the rates of, um, of sinking are. And that will then hopefully, if not really close to balance, at least give us pointers to what the important processes are. Because ask 10 plastic um, uh, scientists here, and I'm sure you will get 10 different answers on what is the number, the order one process here. We really have no idea about what is important if you want to figure out where all the plastic is. Now, the, the project is now 10 years in, um, and we're, we're making some headway. And I want to highlight that um, my PhD student, Mikael Kandorp, has a poster this, uh, this afternoon. Um, it's X4105, where he's trying this and, and, um, for the Mediterranean. So we thought that the Mediterranean, because it's a smaller basin, uh, it might be easier to start with. And he's now doing some uh, machine learning and some um, uh, in inverse modeling to figure out whether we can combine what we know about the sources, what we know about the flow, what we know about uh, where the plastic is, is measured by the manta trolls, combine that all into one big model and get out the three, the, the, well, the, for now at least, the two-dimensional full picture of plastic in the ocean. So he has much more knowledge on, on all the details of this. So in the last few minutes that I have, I want to change stack a little bit. So, so far we've talked about, well, the plastic on sich, right? The plastic itself floating around in the ocean. But of course, the plastic is not the problem. It is the interaction with marine life or the potential interaction with marine life that we should be worried about. So really, if you want to start thinking about the harm that plastic may do or may not do, then it is not enough to know where the plastic is. We also need to know where the animals are and how they are interacting with the plastic. And I teamed up with a, a, a bunch of, uh, of seabird ecologists a few years ago to do exactly that, to combine the maps that we have of floating plastic at the surface of the ocean, which is quite relevant, of course, for seabirds who feed mostly on the surface of the ocean, and to combine those maps with foraging of uh, birds and the uh, occurrence of plastic in, the, in their guts. And when we combined all three, we ended up with a map of where seabirds are most at risk of ingesting plastic. And when I first saw the map, I was shocked. I was surprised because this is the map. So what you see here, and yeah, so this is a number of seabird species. We tested a total of 173. The number of seabird species that are at risk at any location in the ocean from uh, ingesting plastic. Yellow is almost no species. Red is lots of species. And I was surprised when I saw this map because there are no garbage patches. In some ways, the garbage patches, especially in the South Pacific, this is clear, the amount of, of, of seabirds at risk of interacting with plastic is actually lower in the garbage patches. Instead, the hotspots where seabird species are really interacting with plastic are all around New Zealand and in the Southern Ocean in general. Why is that? Well, that is, of course, because that is where the seabirds feed. Most seabirds live in the Southern Ocean, if you, if you, if you look at species at least, so that is where they have most interaction with seabirds, uh, with plastic. There isn't that much plastic yet in the Southern Ocean, but there is enough already for the seabirds, especially the albatrosses, to pick up quite a bit of it. So if we think about risk, and if we think about harm, and if we think about the interaction between ecosystems and plastic, then we really should think about where the two actually meet. We did it with the same group uh, a few months later, also for turtles. And there you see the same thing. There are far fewer species of turtles in the world. But again, you see that the hotspots where most of the turtles are at risk of ingesting plastic are near where they forage. And that doesn't need to be in the garbage patches. The garbage patches are in some ways 
because they're so oligotrophic, because there's so, much, so little living out there, they're, they're relatively devoid of life. So that then really brings me to the somewhat gritty issue and the difficult issue of what, what, how do we deal with this risk? How do we deal with this harm? A lot has been said about plastic. A lot has been said about the plastic that's all around us, that's all in the ocean, and it's easy to observe and easy to photograph, and it's a very visual problem. But it's it turns out to be very difficult to document what actually, at the moment, the harm of all this plastic is to ecosystems, to organisms, to, to species. There's as far as I know, as far as we know, no single species that has actually gone extinct because of plastic. There's only one species, a type of oyster in Japan, that is actually properly um, uh, uh, affected now, that is at the risk of extinction because of plastic. There's just too much plastic going around. And for all the other species, we don't know. And then, somewhat inconvenient articles pop up, like this one, um, Burns and Boxall, a few months ago. And it's, it's, it's far too complicated to completely explain here. It's an ecotoxicological study. But essentially, on the right, the red here shows at what, um, what concentration of plastic we know that certain organisms are dying. Essentially, bi biologists tor torturing oysters by just adding more and more plastic. At some point, they will die. And that's at concentrations of typically 1,000 particles per liter or so. But then if you go back to the environment where these organisms live, then it turns out that these organisms, they typically live at, at, in concentrations of plastic that are 10 to the 8 lower, 10 to a million times to 100 million times lower. So we don't know whether those concentrations are harmful. It could be, it could not be. We only know that for them to immediately die off, we would need at least a million times more plastic in the ocean. And then it becomes even more complicated, because it's not just about the plastic, of course. It's also about all the chemistry that's around us. And this is a fantastic schematic that I took of, of, of Chelsea Rockman of the University of Toronto, of all the interaction. The plastic is not on itself in the ocean, but it interacts with um, uh, additives that are in the, in, in the ocean uh, or in the plastic already, but it also absorbs a lot of uh, toxins that are in very low concentrations in the ocean. And we just, um, with Chelsea, we just had a paper published where we show that actually, if you really want to clean up toxins from the ocean, then maybe taking the plastic out is a really good way to do it, because they're so sorbent to many, many of those toxins that, um, that we often see 10,000 times higher concentrations in the plastic than in the water around it. So these are all the questions that, st that remain open and that we really have no idea how to deal with. Um, and we need many, many, many more of you to help us out with. In your own expertise, in your own thinking, um, if you've got anything that resonates here from your own field, then please come on and join the group and, and start thinking about how we learn something about how our, our Earth, how our ecosystems, how our oceans, how they work from looking at plastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Eric. So we have time for a quick question for Eric, and then we're going to have our three first speakers at the end of this first session before coffee break. So if anyone has a very urgent question they'd like to ask now, please put your hand up. OK, thank you. Is that one more? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this really nice and informative talk. So my question is more a little bit mathematical. Um, if you compare two different data sets, one is biological um, species distribution and the other one is um, um, plastic concentration distribution and you do contour plots. So there's always the question how you harmonize and how you overlay the maps that you don't miss out on the heterogeneity and the, the, the um, uncertainty of contour maps. So I was wondering how you um, were dealing with this issue from a mathematical point of view. 
Yeah, I mean, um, so we used, I, I, I didn't do that part. I, I left that to proper statisticians who know much more about this. Um, but we can talk about this, this later. But yeah, that, that is, yeah. We, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we got that okay. Thank you. So our second speaker is um, Joe Ruxton. Joe has uh, made a career out of marine conservation, initially around um, Asia, all around Asia, being based in Hong Kong for WWF, before she then joined the BBC as uh, one of the researchers and assistant producers for the first series of Blue Planet. She then uh, left the BBC after uh, several years to start and uh, make up her own film. This film, um, some of you I hope in the room may have already, be, already seen, it's been screened in many, many countries um, across the world. It's won, I lose track of how many awards it has won, but it's what it's been absolutely fantastic for is really translating the science for a, a global and social society and really making the science that we're also um, interested in relevant for everyone and bringing that into people's living rooms. So to explain more, starting her journey is gonna start where Eric described right in the center of the North Pacific Gyre. Thank you very much, Joe Ruxton. Thank you, um, Jessica, um, and to EGU for inviting me here and to the Environment Agency for making that happen. Um, it was a, a very long journey for me. Um, deciding to make this film from start to finish actually took eight years. Um, a lot of that was the, the fundraising part of it, um, two years before we raised enough to even do the first shoot. Um, the film, I don't know if anybody's seen it. Uh, if you haven't, it's gonna be screened here tomorrow night. And um, it's quite nice to see it on a big screen. Otherwise, it is available on Netflix. Uh, and again, for those who haven't seen it, I'll just quickly show you the trailer. I remember the first time I saw a blue whale. Oh, look, look. Oh. Wow. I've followed them since childhood. What do you think it's from? Is it from a ship? I could see plastic everywhere. We were in what we thought was a relatively pristine environment. I started to wonder what was happening in oceans elsewhere on the planet. Growing up, my world was the ocean. It's where I feel the most spiritual. As a freediver, it was the place where I proved myself to myself. Finally, have the opportunity to pay the sea back. Only a fraction of the plastic that we produce is recycled. This is never going to degrade. It's got nowhere to go. This was something that these animals, they were forced to endure because it was man-made and we'd put it into their environment. The record is 276 pieces of plastic inside of one 90-day-old chick. If the plastics are in the food chain for the dolphin, they're also in our food chain. Exactly. Communities are built on these landfill sites. So sweet potatoes, corn, sugar cane. All growing on 40 years of garbage. Do you have anything not wrapped in plastic? No. No. <laughs> we have to make our life better for our kids' children. Change is possible. It starts with us. What I'm going to tell you about is the journey to making the film. Um, I'm very aware that we have an awful lot of scientists in the room here and that a lot of the things I was discovering you already knew, um, but you're going to have to bear with me while I tell you the story. So when I started making it, um, the global plastic production was under 300 million tons. Um, five years into the film it was 315 and now it's getting closer to 350. So the right-hand side of that curve is getting very, very steep. And if you look way back in the 1950s and 60s, we were producing less plastic than there is going into the oceans every year now. So it's something that I'm finding quite an urgent thing to be addressed. 
And when I started making it, it was all going to be about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I'd been told that there was this floating continent of plastic out there. And I'd also been told that a team of, <coughs> sorry, a fleet of decommissioned fishing boats were going to head out there and collect it all. And it was all going to be recycled. And it just sounded like this amazing story. Horrible problem, clean it up, job done. And of course, that isn't reality. Um, but I wanted to find out as much as I could before I went. So I did a fair bit of research. And this is the kind of thing that came up with. This was, this was actually in The Independent, which is a British newspaper. And it was saying how this floating continent was, uh, what is this, three times the size of Spain. It's often said to be twice the size of Texas, that it was 10 meters deep. But I couldn't see any pictures. There was nothing coming back from the space station about this. And certainly Google Earth didn't have anything. And then I was looking at other information. The bottom right-hand side there was telling you how long it takes plastic to photodegrade. Well, of course, we all know that plastic doesn't disappear. That's the whole point. It was designed not to. It doesn't break down like natural products do. But to actually put figures on it, like 500 years for a nappy or 450 for a bottle, I thought, well, how do we know that? Plastic's only been around for 150 years, and plastic bottles were probably about 60 years ago, if that. So where were these figures coming from? So I began a journey to head out, and this is taken at the center of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, on that way, I did this as a film recce, and I'd planned all sorts of ways that we would be filming this. I thought we'd have, this is before everybody had drones. We're going to have cameras on cranes going over the top of it. We're going to have divers underneath looking up and seeing little chinks of light coming through. Um, but of course, this was the reality. And on the way, um, our scientists had been deploying manta trawls because I learned a lot on that journey from being with a team of scientists and how plastic becomes very brittle when it gets into the ocean, and on its way into the center, it starts to break up and um, is attracting chemicals at the same time. So we started doing these trawls 400 miles west of San Francisco, and this was the contents of the sieve, and that was the first time I'd seen this happen, other than plankton trawls I'd done at university, but we weren't looking for plastic decades ago. Um, that, so that was the first one, 400 miles. I was shocked, but it was nothing compared to the center. And when we got to the center, every single one was coming up like that. And some of the larger plankton animals, little jellies and so on, you could see plastic inside them. And that, and the fact that I'd learned about how the plastics adsorb chemicals and, of course, leach them too, made me realize that this wasn't going to be a story about this huge floating island of trash, this story was suddenly a lot more serious because, of course, the plankton is the heart of the food chain, and that food chain leads to us. And that gave me an idea that I might be able to get a bigger audience for this because some people care about the oceans, some people love to watch films about wildlife, but it's the ones that aren't interested in the environment that you often need to reach. And something that had some kind of threat to human health, I thought we might be able to draw more people in. But as a filmmaker, I didn't know how to make this interesting because really pulling up a load of sieves, you know, trying to do that for a full feature length documentary wasn't going to be too exciting. So I had to think about the kind of animals that we might want to use. And I had to think about who might feed on, on plankton. Um, obviously, the, the fish that we're eating do. And that was part of the, the thought that I had because what I learned about these chemicals were was the links to um, critical disease that they have. And these are the sort of things that I'm sure you're all aware of. Now, it's very difficult because you can't, in your film, say that if you eat this many fish that have eaten that much plastic, you will get one of these diseases. It's just not that simple. And you can't do experiments on humans. But my thought is, if there is any threat, if there's any link, why would we keep letting plastic go into the ocean like this? So the answer was to come up with, as somebody said earlier, charismatic megafauna. And what could be more charismatic than a blue whale? So we went off to film those. Uh, we were supposed to be darting them, or our scientists had had permission from the Sri Lankan government for two years to dart these whales. And um, the day our crew arrived, that permission was withdrawn. Um, however, where we were filming the whales, we did find huge swathes of plastic in the ocean. I should have had a slide in there, but you know what it looks like. Lots of plastic on the surface of the ocean, right where the whales are feeding. 
one of the questions that I ask school children when I talk to them is knowing that a blue whale is huge, opens its mouth, takes in a lot of seawater to filter, and I ask them how many litres of seawater a blue whale will take in in one mouthful. And you get all sorts of answers, but it's usually about 5,000 is the biggest, and it's 75,000. And when you've just seen the footage, when you've got the whale there and you've got a lot of plastic in the ocean, that gets everybody thinking. Now, we've also heard a lot in this morning's session about what's happening on the sea floor. So we um, contacted COMEX. We were speaking to um, Dr. Uh, Francois Galgani, and he'd been looking at um, accumulations of plastic on the seabed, particularly in the Mediterranean. And COMEX were the people that um, he'd been working with to use their subs. So the idea was that we would do quite a few dives. We booked it for three days. And the um, weather turned just as the entire crew had flown in. And we had crew coming in from America, from Hong Kong, and from the States. And uh, two of us had driven all the uh, equipment over because you can't take a load of filming gear on EasyJet very easily because <laughs> the allowance is so small. So I think we got as far as Leon when we got a call from the office saying uh, they can't launch the sub this week, it's not safe. And when you've raised all your money for your filming with sponsors, it's very difficult to, it's not like the BBC when you can think, oh, all right, we'll just hang around, we'll do it next week. When you've raised all this funds and it has to do, you have to do something with it, it's very difficult to actually say, well, sorry, we've got to give all this up, everybody fly back. So it was a case of thinking what we could do instead. We'd been filming um, cetaceans in the med as well and needed to get the lab results, and they were in the University of Siena. So it was a case of seeing if everyone's up for a road trip, we'll go off there, do that, call again which we did, and they said, right, if you come back next Tuesday, we should get two days weather win window. But by the time we all got back to Marseille, we were down to one day again, and we couldn't get out to the known debris fields um, where uh, Galgani had done his work. So it was the first time in my life when I was actually watching the footage come back from the sub, and I was praying that we'd find plastic in the ocean. Um, and as you'll see in the film, um, we did start seeing it almost straight away. And then I've got one of Galgani's shots here, which we put in as the, um, the ROV shot. There's a secret from the film for you. So I think one of our most powerful sequences one from, was from seabirds in the Southern Ocean. We ended up with three sequences of seabirds. They're real sentinels, I think. And um, we did the albatross one, and, um, but also shearwaters. We did two in Australasia. This one is a um, flesh-footed seawater, flesh-footed shearwater, flesh-footed, like, you know what I mean, um, in Lord Howe Island, and this is Dr. Dr. Jennifer Lavers with the bird. Um, we also filmed in Tasmania the short-tailed shearwaters, but although that story was very strong, it didn't make it into the final cut. So what Jen does is she's putting, um, she'd noticed, because she's been working there a long time, she'd been noticing plastic debris around the burrows of these seabirds and realized that they were being fed plastic and vomiting it up. So what she would do is put ambient seawater into their stomachs and actually make them vomit it up. And she's looking to see how much they've got. But also, um, she would then feed them a nice meal of squid to try and give them some kind of energy for the long migration that she had to do. And we were on the beach the next morning. Uh, I think we found something like 10 dead birds and this little one that was struggling down to the sea as well um, didn't make it. Um, what I'm going to do now is show you a fo uh, some footage, which is a combination of this sequence, just a little bit from this, and a little bit from the albatross one as well, the Laysan albatross, um, just to give you an idea of the two sequences we've got in the film, in case you haven't seen it.
Just before I go any further, the last 20 minutes of the film is all about solutions and what we can do, so it's not, it's not as depressing as it might seem. Um, one of the last uh, shoots that we did was um, in Tuvalu, and Tuvalu actually meant an awful lot to me at the time. I'd, I'd never heard of it before I went there, I confess. I'd heard of Kiribati, and it used to be part of Kiribati. Um, and in the 70s, they, in the late 70s, they got their independence and um, started importing goods from um, around the world, but particularly from Asia. Some of the Northern Islands still look absolutely beautiful and they live very sustainably. Um, it's a fascinating place to visit because there's no tourism, no bars. Um, the hotel is a, it's a case of, you want breakfast? Do you want me to go and buy some eggs? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very strange place to, to visit, particularly when you get stuck because of cyclones, but that's another story. Um, but the people are, they tell stories through song and dance. They tell history through song and dance. And it's the most amazing thing. And they will have dance-offs between islands. And it can go on all day long. And it's almost as if the cheerful faces are hiding this, this horrible secret, this factor that's been going on since they started importing plastics. Because you saw the island, there is nowhere to put it. They're burning it all the time. The sickness there was quite incredible. The family group that we were filming, there were 30 of them, and six had, uh, had cancer, and two had died of cancer in the previous 18 months. The kids come home from school, they melt plastic, they don't have toys. They're just breathing in this horrible black fumes all the time. Um, I'll show you um, just a, a bit of a clip from there, um, just to give you an idea of what it's, what it's like around the villages. Their lagoon is completely trashed. Um, they, can't, they can't fish in the lagoon anymore, but they do feed the fish to the pigs. Um, but when you're watching it, I want you to have a, an idea of what I felt when I was there, because we hear about these places, some of us get to see them, but in our lives, the reality of plastic is, is, it's in a few places. You know, you've got to look to see it. I see it a lot more now and I've seen it changing. But being on that little island, to me, was like having a glimpse into the future. If we don't get our act together, this is just gonna creep up on us. You know, the, that, 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 um, that graph I showed you at the beginning, the exponential end is gonna be almost vertical. Predictions are by 2050, three times as much being manufactured every year, half of which for single use. And that's why it's so important that we change. But just give, to, to give you a flavor of, of what it's like on Tuvalu and the whole listlessness. This, um So that's what I don't want in our future. And, and it, it really resonated with me. And it's, it's, it's just, you know, you look at the kids there, they've already got problems with um, sea level rises. And, uh, you know, you compare it to, our, to the, uh, the children in our families. And I, it just, it really brought it home to me. And it's something that I think is preventable. I'm amazed at how many people are now aware of this and the solutions and alternatives and decisions that are being made um, at government level as well, around the world. And uh, so I still have hope, pleased to say, despite all these depressing things. Um, if you'd like to know more about the work of Plastic Oceans UK, um, do go to this website. Make sure you go to the .uk one. You'll see the work that we're doing globally in education and um, sustainability and science. We're supporting science. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to three of the um, documents you can download from our website. The first one talks about how we're doing the education work, the pillars that we've got in that, and how everything is linked towards solutions. Um, the science behind the film is a document that we created for the film to come out. 
Um, uh, being a scientist, uh, my background is in science. I'm always, uh, I'm always wanting to stick to the facts. I think if you don't stick to the facts, you're not going to change policy because if you're ever questioned, you've got to be able to back it. So it's a document that we did with um, Brunel University. It takes you up to um, 2017, uh, January 2017, and we're in the process now of um, updating that. There's 20 pages of references, and it's an 80-page document, and I wish to goodness I'd had it when I decided to make the film. And the Plastic Rivers one is one that's been launched today. So um, it's, it's addressing the fact that so much of this, you know, the ocean is the final casualty but the rivers are like the arteries that feed it. So um, those are they. I finished early. That's most unlike me. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So we have time for one, maybe two questions because she, Jo has finished early. So if anyone wants to put their hand up, they've got a question. Now's the time. You can't possibly have a question. Hi, Joe. Um, in a previous presentation, Eric uh, mentioned the, the lack of knowledge between the impact we're having on marine life ecosystems. Mm. I'm well aware of the collection of whale poo from the shoot. Do you know, because I haven't heard, did anything come of that research yes. and what was the result? Yes. Um, just to answer David's question, when we were filming the blue whales, we had what has since become known as a punami. Um, we had the, the crew in the water and, and one of the whales did decide to open its bowels. And it was like the whole of the ocean was covered in the most stinking orange pizza topping, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, our scientist, Lindsay, was excitedly collecting it up um, so that she could study it. So she had to put it in liquid nitrogen and take it back to Hong Kong. Actually, it sat in Sri Lanka for two years before um, she finally got all the permits and everything to take some poo. It's quite amazing. Um, and she found a few tiny pieces um, which were filmed, but it wasn't as an exciting uh, enough sequence to go into the main film. But thank you for that one. Thanks for the reminder. Do we have any more questions right now? We have another opportunity after our third speaker. If you have one in your mind, just keep it. Oh, we've got a last minute entry over there. <laughs> Thank you. Not too scientific. Remember, I'm a filmmaker. I try. Um, well, thanks, uh, first of all, for, for that uh, interesting presentation. I was wondering, this last island that you showed, which is obviously a very shocking um, example, mm. Um, and it is, it is obviously very well, let's say, sad, but also interesting that uh, quite a bit of the population developed cancer. Do you know if there is any follow-up research to see what the origin of this cancer is? I so don't think so. Really um, related? I'm sorry, yes. We, we did interview the doctor in the hospital there, um, but unfortunately her English wasn't, was so bad that we couldn't actually get... We couldn't tell how well she was answering our questions, so we didn't think it was going to work in the film. She thought that it was due to that, but nobody had done any studies. The work that had been done um, by NGOs um, on the island were um, Australian groups who'd come in who were concerned about climate change and re uh, taking the people from the island to um, repopulate them in Fiji. Um, I understand that there's been work done more recently where they've gone in to clean up the island um, but that's been about getting the plastic off the island. I'm not aware of any studies that have been done, and I do ask um, our fixer there quite often, so I, I'm guessing not. All right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. So our third speaker is a freelance journalist from the UK. She has um, works on several newspapers, all on gen um, sustainable issues. Uh, she has a weekly slot on the BBC One show, where Lucy often talks about plastics. Uh, she, this, isn't a recent, this isn't a recent topic for Lucy. She has been very passionate about plastics for a very, very long time. Uh, it first started off in 2005, when she was investigating plastic packaging. And it's uh, grown and grown from there. So can I have a very warm welcome, please, for Lucy Siegel. Thank you.
thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. So um, thank you for being in this session and thanks for inviting me and to all the associated agencies. Um, I don't always get to speak to uh, a mass of highly trained professional scientists, so it's both daunting and an opportunity as well. Um, and Eric, I quoted you a lot in my book, which I, I just gave you a copy, and I've written tentatively, I hope I haven't misquoted you in the start of it. So um, this, this, I hope, will give you some insight into how we take your research and what we do with it. I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so, uh, unlike Joe's film, or, or, or unlike Joe's um, assertion about the BBC being able to stay out for as long as they want, <laughs> uh, I work in the rather less robustly financed area. Huh? 20 years ago. 20 years ago, yes. Yeah, I never got those times, but it's certainly not like that now on the show that I work for. Um, so, I'll give you some context to how we get our stories. I work on a very mainstream show called The One Show, as... as um, as uh, Jess said, and we have a, quite a large audience in this day and age. So we, we're between seven and five million viewers every single weekday night. So it's, it's known as the mainstream. I can't speak officially for them because I am freelance. So this is purely, these are all observations that I'm gonna tell you today. But we basically have a day or maybe two days to make a film we are in a very um, a strange part of the media world called factual entertainment, which <laughs> is, uh, is in itself both an opportunity and a cross to, to bear as well. Um, so we're not natural history. We do have drones, and some of the directors are very keen on drones indeed. In fact, they put everything on a drone. We also have a lot of GoPros. So you'll see sometimes slightly odd, odd footage, especially in recycling centers, where they like to put the, uh, the, the, the eye view from the point of view of the machinery. So we do lots of kind of strange visual techniques to try and humanize um, the science. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about how we got our mandate to talk about plastics because we've been talking about plastics a lot. It's not a show that covers environmental topics. That's not our, our thing. It's not our purpose. So we cover every sort of topic and we cover celebrity, we cover new film releases. So to put environmental films and to put films about plastic in that context is very interesting. And of course, the reason why that's happened is because we've had something that's been called an awakening. A lot of this is attributed to Blue Planet 2 and those 15 minutes that focused on plastic and the impact of plastic on a, a whale and, al and an albatross. But as you can clearly see from Joe's amazing film, uh, she was already doing it. So there are lots of different reasons why a particular piece of TV hits at a particular moment. And we won't go on about that today because we're not at the um, Edinburgh TV Festival. But it is kind of interesting as well, because if you look at these watershed moments, as this has been called, what are we look really looking at? And I think what we're looking at is a disruptive moment. So the way that I look, and I've worked a lot in um, supply chain issues around sustainability, uh, my particular area of expertise is the fashion industry which has recently aligned with plastics, which we probably won't talk about today, but is also very interesting in and of itself. And I tend to look out for these disruptive moments. Now, uh, if you listen to the producers of Blue Planet 2 and they explain how, how that footage came to be used in Blue Planet 2, it is actually um, a really interesting case because it was when the documentary makers found that they couldn't go on pushing the plastic away from the lens because that would contravene almost editorial policy and they'd be lying to the viewer, that they changed their mission or they were able to overstep their own mandate. And their mandate is to produce good-looking, inspiring, evocative uh, nature documentaries which make us fall in love with the planet, not apparently to champion particular causes, which is seen as quite a political move. So it was, it was only when they were unable to disguise the fact, which is, is, could be considered quite inauthentic in and of itself, that we have this disruptive breakthrough moment, and that's kind of changed everything. So you'll probably be familiar with 
um, the, the sense that so many people have watched Blue Planet. Who, who here has seen Blue Planet 2? Oh, surprisingly. If you talk to uh, an audience of uh, uh, normal people, let's put it like that, non-scientists, <laughs> They've all seen it. They've all seen it. So that's, that is pretty interesting. But because we're a big supermarket economy in the UK, um, we know that we have a real packaging problem. And I'm going to talk about this issue from a UK standpoint, because that's mainly where I work, although not exclusively. Um, we also, as I'll explain in a, in a minute, we also have a real issue over data and metrics and all the rest of it. So um, don't be surprised that, that my evidence here is from a supermarket survey, which is not the most robust thing in the world, but that tends to be what we have to use. So according to one survey, 88% of viewers in the UK, and it was a big viewing audience, 62% of the television audience who viewed Blue Planet, did something to change their plastic usage habits or levels of consumption. That's really, really significant because we've not seen anybody galvanise or such a group galvanise behind anything like this, uh, perhaps ever. So, what's going on? Am I doing this wrong? I'm using the mouse. Or maybe you might have to do it for me. A short technical hitch. So, basically... So, you can... Oh, here. Oh, right. Okay. Could, how do I get it onto the next slide? Uh, right. Left click. Thank and you. right click to go back. Okay, right. So, um, we have suddenly got a mandate. And I'm a non-scientist as well. Um, I should make that very clear. It will probably become very clear. Um, so I look for opportunities to talk about this subject, to talk about sustainability in general, but particularly I wanted to focus on plastics, and I will explain that in a minute as well. So uh, the first thing that happened to me was that it changed the way that I viewed the issue. We suddenly had this mandate and we're able to talk about it quite openly and make some films about it. And I was able to get some content out there, but it also had a bearing on me. And I thought, well, what am I doing to address the problem? And I found that I wanted to do something really active. So I moved near to the river, moved near to the Thames, and then I now kayak every day and just pick out as much plastic as I can out of the Thames. And I take my little dog with me, whether he wants to or not. He's quite an old little dog and he can't swim. So but he's got used to it. He's got used to it. And then he has to share the space with all the plastic bottles that I pick out of the water. Um, so the other thing that I did was try and use any influence I had on the TV shows that I work on to try and build some content. And I also released a book which is full of practical solutions about how you can try and combat this influx of information and how you can do something positive. Because a lot of people were feeling very hyped up, very keyed up, but they weren't necessarily feeling very empowered. And I think that's really, really important. Um, so I basically normally look like this delightful uh, image in the corner here. So you've got me on a good day today, but I'm normally wearing a hard hat and I'm normally in some sort of recycling facility or, or looking at the plastics chain manufacture through to disposal uh, across the UK and sometimes beyond um, and looking at actually what happens to polymers and how they're created and all that sort of thing. So what I wanted to do was piece together, if you like, um, uh, all the different parts in the jigsaw and have that conversation with our viewers. Um, again, the mandate for doing that was that we were receiving hundreds and sometimes thousands of emails every week from our viewers asking us questions. They would even return bits of plastic that they didn't want or felt were unnecessary and they would personally address their plastic to me. So I would go into the studio and I would have quite a lot of lasagna trays still with lasagna in that had been sent to me at work. Quite what they expected me to do with it, I don't know, but I'm taking it as a signal that they were very into this issue and they wanted to do something. They wanted to be part of a solution. Because we are factual entertainment, and we're not a nature show, we're not a, we are not a, um, uh, a science show, we have to try and be entertaining. So one of the things that we were able to use quite early on uh, are our celebrity guests. So this is Gordon Ramsay, who is a, a chef and presents a number of programs and restaurant owner. Um, and he uh, was still using plastic straws in his 
restaurants across the UK. So we basically confronted him about it and asked him when we were going to change. So sometimes we were trying to pressurise well-known people with profile into making a switch or asking them to get involved in campaigns. The other thing that we have to focus on is because we're talking to non-specialists and we're talking to busy people who are going about their everyday lives, holding down jobs, sometimes multiple jobs, kids, all the rest of it, all the kind of hustle and bustle of life. And we wanted to engage them where it mattered most. And most people, we found this early on, didn't respond to, would you like to help, help solve the plastic pandemic or the global plastic pandemic? They would say, no, it's not our fault. We're really not, uh, you know, we don't see how we're connected to it, all the rest of it. And they'd make quite a lot of excuses. So one of the things that I've always done is to start really small and I'd sell people an opportunity that they wanted. And most people responded really well to the opportunity, would you like to get control of your kitchen bit? In your trash can. And it is so surprising how many people feel that their kitchen bin is out of control. And from that, we were able to start these little grids. So people would keep these grids on their, on their fridges. And we had hundreds of people doing this all across the UK. And they would start to document the plastic that was flowing into their lives. And what they'd really noticed early on was how much of it they didn't ask for and they didn't, in fact, want. And they considered it to, it to be unnecessary. And that was quite important in terms of our mandate for change as well. So there were some concepts that we found really difficult to get across at first. And one of the issues was that although people uh, were very um, exercised and upset about visible pieces of plastic in the ocean and in waterways, they didn't necessarily get the concept of macro to micro. And I think Eric was talking about this before when he said that people always want to know, has he stood on the trash island? This is what people are really interested in. And in this way, the general public is very similar to commissioning editors who commission TV. And they, they probably have each other's interests at heart. So whenever you pitch an idea, you know, the, the commissioning editor will be like, well, where's the big pile of trash? Are you going to be able to stand on it? And are we going to be able to do a stunt? Like, are we going to be able to deliver it to the studio and drop it in front of the television centre. So that everything had to be done with a big splash. And when you explain that it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, that is when you start to lose both the viewer and the commissioning editor, who often act as one. So one of the things that we found it quite hard to, to get across to people um, is that macroplastics become microplastics. So they are told that plastics will be there for all time, for all eternity. And after, after people have learned that, it's very hard for them then to understand that actually plastics do degrade and they degrade in the natural environment. And that although in life, big problems are usually more easy to handle when they become small problems, plastic's kind of the other way around. And the small plastics, they're the real, real issue. So that's something that we've had to really work hard, both to visualize, because as Joe says, endless pictures of Petri dishes and nets don't really do it for the, for, for the viewing public, and you can understand why. So we've had to use a lot of different ideas to try and transmit that. Oh, I keep going back. Useless at this. Right, here we go. So, in the end, we were work able, working with Surface Against Sewage and the, um, the great, no, the big spring beach clean. I must get that right the wrong way. Um, we were able to do what everybody wanted and to get a load of plastic from all around the UK and to dump it outside Television Centre and the BBC. And this was really important. We did this almost a year ago, so we're coming up to the anniversary of doing this. And this was very, very important that people were able to see the plastics. And then we were able to get into a conversation about what really happens to UK recycling. This is one of the families that we work with, a proud family from Manchester in the northwest of the UK. And this is them learning about what happens to their plastic. And it wasn't good news. In fact, they were pretty horrified. What they found was that when we went to the recycling centre, 
all the plastic or a large proportion of the plastic that they'd cheerfully and willingly sorted and kept separate, even to the extent that they were checking the, um, the different triangles on the bottom and trying to work out what polymer it was, rinsing it really nicely. They were spending about 30 minutes each evening going through their rubbish and making sure they had state-of-the-art, pristine, top-rate recyclers. And then when we took it to the materials uh, recovery facility, or MRF, we found out that because of the state of the global recycling market, that they were only really interested in uh, plastic, clear plastic bottles. They weren't really interested in the, in the pots and the trays and all the rest of it. And this is something that we've come up against time and time again, because quite often people are being sold the solution civil society is being sold the solution to the plastic crisis that it will come in being able to recycle more efficiently or recycle more. And what we're not having or we're not hearing is the question of volume, that we're simply putting too much volume on the world market and that this is where the real problem is coming from. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, more. So what we also found was a crisis of confidence in the statistics or the data sets that we had about UK recycling. And we found that um, there were a lot of loopholes that were being exploited by manufacturers and brands and retailers, and that actually we were not recycling uh, uh, very much at all, percentage-wise, and that our recycling rates were very low compared to other other countries. And what we were doing was obviously exporting the problem elsewhere, which is, as we know, what, what uh, rich Western countries do. We also remember that one of the reasons why Blue Planet hit at that particular point was because China had closed its doors uh, to low-grade plastic waste, which is what most of our countries are expert at producing. So we had the conflation of quite a lot of things going on underneath. The mechanisms, if you like, were starting to unfurl. Now, this was something that we kind of had to wait to explain and talk about after the initial, the initial impact and the initial emotive impact of Blue Planet 2. Uh, but it's become a very important thing for us. And without Without wanting to dismiss concerns, most of our viewing public and the people that I speak to um, are absolutely convinced that at some point recycling is going to solve the problem. And this is a, a project uh, called Everyday Plastic where uh, one guy who lives in the UK decided that he didn't trust the official figures which, which had uh, inflated uh, recycling amounts and he actually kept his plastic for a year in his own flat and then has worked with a team of researchers to aggregate or to get figures from that. So people are taking even the data sets into their own hands. So what all of this added up to, which is really important and probably the thing that matters most to me at the moment, is that we were able to expose this, um, this response that retailers and manufacturers have been giving us for many, many years, probably over a decade. When it comes to overpackaging, when we have laws to stop overpackaging, which are hardly ever used, um, the retailer always responds with the phrase, the consumer demands it, the consumer wants this packaging. And this is the get out of jail free card, which is consistently used to bat away any criticism or any action over over packaging. And what we were demonstrating, possibly for the first time ever, through all of this and through all our engagement and through all the mandate delivered to us by our viewers and our readers across the media, was that the consumer did not demand it. In fact, they were not only irrita irritated by it, but they were prepared to take a stance and they would no longer accept over-packaging and unnecessary plastic into their lives. So this was critical because this is the first time we've really seen this shift. I've gone back again, I really like that slide. Okay, so we have been here before, in a sense. This is not the first time that large audiences have got upset about overuse of plastic or excessive amounts of waste. So in 1987, um, a barge in New York became uh, really famous for a barge. Barges don't usually become famous, I think we have to concede. And this was the Drobo 400 that was loaded up with rubbish from New York State and sent uh, towards Belize to dump the rubbish. It spent about six months trekking up and down the east coast 
of America, went up to Belize, and it was refused entry there. And it was the first time, really, that, a, that an audience, a huge audience, had become aware on TV that this was happening to their rubbish. And it was called the Garbage, and it became kind of very famous. And newscasters, every night there would be footage of where it was now. Eventually, it came back to Brooklyn, and the waste was burned. But we do have a history of people exposing the volume of waste that we're producing and asking us what we're going to do about it. I have my own history with this, we all do. This is my particular bete noir, and it's the shrink-wrapped coconut. So in 2005, I did a big project with a newspaper that I worked for, uh, The Observer, and we examined the rubbish, the waste of four different families in the UK. For some reason, they collected it for us over Christmas. I, I don't know why they agreed to do it, but they, they, it was brilliant. And we went through, we weighed all of it, and we found that plastic was by far the biggest share of the waste that they were throwing away. Um, and this was the real thing that really got my goat, was the, the shrink wrap plastic coconut, because we know that coconuts come in their own fibrous shell, they're very robust, blah, blah, blah. And I started a dialogue with uh, UK retailers, which quickly turned into quite an acrimonious dispute. And one of the excuses that I received for doing this was that uh, the hairs on a coconut shell might get trapped in a child's throat and choke the child were it not wrapped. At that point, we sort of descended into the realms of the, of the surreal. Um, eventually, the retailer backed down and said they wouldn't do it anymore. So I revisit this in 2017 off the back of Blue Planet and the mandate of my viewers and all the rest of it, and I find that the situation's got even worse. Not only are shrink-wrapped coconuts now in every single retailer in the UK, and I've seen them in lots of other countries as well, you may even have them here, but they've compounded the problem. They're adding a, um, a ring pull at the top of this product, a straw underneath, and the straw is wrapped in plastic. So there's about four or five extra different polymer types which are now attached to this product. And to add insult to injury, they've stamped it with the phrase genuine coconuts. What is a non-genuine coconut? Please tell me. I've also worked with celebrities. This is Ellie Golding, the singer. And um, uh, we've worked on influencer engagement. So really trying to just travel some of these messages. I'm actually at the back of this turtle, which we're releasing back into the sea at Wutamu in Kenya. Um, uh, so I've worked a lot around those more traditional forms of telling these stories and trying to get engagement as well. Um, one of the things that we always look for, of course, is the big story. Um, and this is uh, out on the coast of Sicily with a group called Healthy Seas who are removing uh, ghost fishing nets. And it's a huge operation. This day I happened to luck out because this was the biggest net that they'd ever got at two and a half tonnes. And it was a really complicated day. So here's me trying to interview some Sicilian fishermen who don't speak Italian, they speak a Sicilian dialect, uh, with a Polish woman who's translating for me. And then all the divers in the water who you can't see are all Dutch. So it was like the United Nations on two boats. Um, but we kind of got the story in the end, mainly because it was so visual. And then, of course, that's not necessarily the end of the story because then we get um, the, the product is turned by a company called Aquafil into nylon, which is then used in uh, fashion products. And of course, across the world, consumers love this story because they can still be consumers, right? And, <laughs> and they get to do something good for the ocean. So I'm just gonna, this just brings me on to some, some closing thoughts because as someone who likes to um, humanize the ocean, Am I going backwards or forwards now? As someone who likes to humanize the ocean, I've actually sort of personified it today because what I wanted to say in this talk was plastics, you've got our attention as if they have actually come and got our attention. But where do we go next and what we do with it? And one of the things that we've done, and I think this is the same with any critical subject which gets a lot of attention, we've made some mistakes, obviously. And I think one of the big mistakes that we have is still that we haven't broken this link between activism and action and consumerism. So we're still told that you can buy this to help, you can do this to help, and it's all linked around our uh, apparently necessary drive to keep consuming, which is obviously a problem in and of itself. One of the other things that happened, and I was very cognizant of, was when I was trying to put stories together, is that it's as if a spotlight has landed on the subject but a lot of the, the uh, innovation was not ready 
to be exposed. So it was put into the sunlight a little bit early, if you like. So then we get a lot of weird and wonderful messages coming out. So I'll never remember the day when we were, I'll never forget the day rather, when we were really at our fever pitch of trying to act on plastics. And we've been doing this series of film. We dumped all the plastic outside the BBC. And then a story came out that enzymes would, would just eat through it all. And I had people coming up to me, members of the public would come up to me and say, oh, you don't have to worry about that plastic thing anymore, do you? Because I read in the newspaper that the enzymes will eat it all. And then you have to go back and explain, it's not quite ready yet, it's a little bit more complicated than that. That particular enzyme only relates to one sort of plastic, PET, which we already are, know how to recycle. And on and on it goes. But it's also been really important to tell those innovation stories as well. Because the general public, when they put their faith in recycling, they're obviously putting their faith in mechanical recycling, which is fairly rudimentary, so we chop it up and then we turn it into something else. Mainly park benches, which I would say that people don't really want. We're going to have a lot of park benches made of recycled consumer stuff very, very soon. They're going to be everywhere. They'll probably be in the ocean. Awful. Anyway, so we've done a lot of films on chemical recycling. We've looked at lots of different ways. And what we're trying to do is spot the runners and riders. And I think that when you write about sustainability or you broadcast about sustainability, what you're trying to do is get people ready for change. So that when they see something, they're not freaked out by it. It's just as simple as that. So I think that's been really, really important. When we do talk about enzymes and innovation in general, we have a lot of baggage. And I just want to momentarily talk about the baggage that we carry with us over this issue. So uh, Doomwatch was a show that came out in the 1970s before I was born. And it was really, really funny because I could notice a lot of skepticism amongst the general public. They either were all over enzymes, like they thought it was the greatest solution, or they were very, very fearful. And I started talking to researchers about why this might be. And culturally, they thought it was down to this Doomwatch program, where enzymes take, up, take over the world and actually are able to govern the entire planet. And they eat through everything, and then there's just a group of enzymes sitting around a sort of board table at the end of it, or whatever, which they haven't eaten. And this had seeped into our culture and continued to perforate over many decades and one of the lead scientists on the enzyme project at the University of Portsmouth had written a sort of cheery article about what might happen to plastics in the future and received a furious letter from a gentleman in America who said, I've just bought a sports car and if I come down in the morning, this, this car has been my dream for many years, if I come down one morning and there's just a steering wheel left because your enzymes have eaten through my car, I will hold you personally responsible. So these things live very long in the cultural memory, and I think we have to work a little bit harder to dispel them. Um, I probably don't have time to, I definitely don't have time to go into the rhetoric of litter, but one of the things that we have got to address is the fact that we have taken the general public so far on this journey, and I think it's really important, and it's the first time that people have been galvanised in this way, and I think we can learn a lot of lessons from it, but we tend to fall back, we all do this, into a position of comfort, and one of the things we love to do is to pretend that it's someone else who's causing this problem. So we have a particular tradition in the UK of looking out for litter louts, we're always on the lookout for litter louts, and when we find them, we're going to shout at them, we're going to give them a big fine, of course, that's not the issue. The issue is the volume of plastic that we are producing. So to move these debates along and have a genuine conversation, we have to slay some of these sacred cows, and that is very, very difficult. I'm going to go through all of this, and I'm going to get to this central point. I'm hearing a lot that people are... Um, worried and a little bit bemused. So we need to talk about climate. Why aren't we talking about climate? And it can seem, particularly with the energy and the dynamism of the school climate strikes, that, and Greta Thunberg and that whole movement, that there's one, only one generation who want to talk about climate, and everyone else is off on a weird plastics thing, just going on and on about plastics and litter and a blah, blah, blah. Well, for me, I see them as being very, very connected. And I think we are dealing now with a mass population. I think we have got people's attention. People react different, differently. People have different cognition. They have different cultural experiences. They have different fears, and they express things in a very different way. Climate change is a very scary topic for different people for a variety of reasons which we're all aware of. 
Plastics, for me, is a breakthrough or a gateway issue. And I think the two are obviously intimately connected. So as Joe was talking about before, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing more and more plastic, more and more polymers made from oil come into the global market every year. We have a legacy problem with the cleanup. We're adding more to that every single year. Um, obviously, that is a mechanism for fossil fuel. We know that more manufacturers come on board because of shale gas. So these things are all very interlinked. And for me, plastics is a very important touchstone for people who are not ready or will not talk about climate. And I think we need to recognize that. And I think we need to be opportunistic about how we talk about climate change through that and how we get our next mandate for action as we have been up to this point with plastics. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you for listening to me, and uh, again, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Lucy. I'd like to invite Eric and Joe back up to the stage, please. So we have a little bit of time now. If you have any questions you wanted to ask earlier for any of our three speakers, um, there'll be some microphones going around the room. Yeah, is that one on? Uh, yeah, yes, it will work. Yeah. So they can carry it and then okay. around. Okay. Well, you take turns. Or you can also, like, uh, do the middle So is there anyone who would like to start off the questions, please? Thank you, David. Hi, Lucy. Um, it's a question for Lucy. Um, your last point there, which was quite interesting. Um, climate, and, I, and I, I allude to it sometimes when I, I give presentations, uh, about plastic pollution, um, mainly because I think climate change is a predicament. That's to say, we've already jumped off the cliff and we're going to land, and no matter how much we wave our arms around, we're going to hit the bottom, and we need to be thinking about how we can mitigate against the, the, the results rather than try and stop it. It's happening. And, I, and, and whereas plastic pollution is still a problem. That's to say we're hanging off the end of the cliff and we can still pull ourselves up. So I think, is that possibly where, where this is going? I mean, I, I, I think there is an issue with people talking about climate change, but I think it's because it's a predicament as opposed to being a problem. And because it's still a problem, we can still, and I know Joe agrees with me, we can still resolve this issue within our, with it, certainly within our next generation's lifetimes. What well, you don't think we can with climate change? I think we have a bigger problem. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely... Are they not, well, they're not disconnected, though, are they? So, um, really, if we're looking at... I mean, if you're looking at, like, plastic pollution, like your yoghurt tub or whatever, you know, it should be a stranded asset, really. <laughs> it is a stranded asset. We're just pretending it's not, and there's a lot of mechanisms uh, to make sure that it, it, it hasn't reached that... Um, what do you call it? That sort of break point when... when rock bottom if you like. So I think that um, we're just not looking at the issues in necessarily the same way, but they're very, very connected. In terms of people's psychology and psyche and why they might choose to get engaged with one and not another, I think one of the things that has happened with plastics is it's not so politicised. So, you know, we've had lots of references to climate change recently, you know, the new person from Brazil, the interior ministers, referred to climate change as a Marxist plot, you know, all of this kind of thing. Um, so it, it, people feel more comfortable with it, um, by and large. And I think for me, it's about how we, how we take some of the mechanisms for change that we found around plastics, and we start a conversation around climate change or we use it as a gateway because I'm, I'm told quite often by researchers right the problem with plastics is that people do their little thing they change their cup or they carry a water bottle like me or whatever and then that, that's where it stops and they ignore everything else and when I say well that's interesting how, how what evidence do you have for this they don't have any <laughs> um, and I prefer to see that as an opportunity so every time I see people with a cup or a bottle or whatever I think Okay, there's a signal. So how do we move on to the next phase of the program? Because I see it almost as, a, as a, a, a continuum of change, if you like. Thank you. Are there any more questions or would anyone else like to add to that? Another question, thank you. 
Thank you very much to the three of you for the presentations. Um, this one is for Lucy. Uh, so which uh, approach would you consider the most effective to create awareness in, in people with this problem? Because you mentioned earlier that, for example, um, telling people it would be convenient to have a, a better way of handling, for example, your bin. You know? So it's something that it's bothering. So, so, for example, telling them how this might affect them um, in, in health-wise, for example, wouldn't that be... So in, in your personal experience, what... Yeah. It really depends on the audience and who you're talking to. And one of the um, uh, slightly vulgar things about what I do is that I'm basically a salesperson. I'm just a salesperson on behalf of the biosphere. So if I'm trying to sell you something, I will use anything anything to get you to buy. So I might start with a very clear proposition. <laughs> Would you like to get control of your bin? If that's not working, I might try something else. So maybe I, ha I probably have a different ethics level <laughs> compared to uh, 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 communicating scientists who need to communicate. But I do think that we need to be really agile in the way that we communicate. And I don't think we can just pick one way of doing it. I think there's, there's so many different areas. And for years and years, when we've been co communicating environmental issues, we've been repeating the same mistakes. And I think one of the problems is that we do stick to a course of action. Right, we're going to just tell everyone the truth and how terrible it is. Oh, no, that's not worked. Loads of people are freaked out. Now we're going to pretend it's really great. Or now we're going to do it by stealth. And the point, the point is, we need to have so much diversity in communication. We need to have, if you just look at TV, for example, we need to have diversity of the people who are telling the stories. So if you don't like one person, you know, presenters annoy the hell out of people. I annoy them. People turn off when I come on, you know, some of them my family. But we've got to have other ones that they can go to who they do like. So all different ages, all different classes, you know, all, you know, all of these things need to happen. But we need to have a very diverse way of telling the stories story. Not that it's untruthful, but that we are showing this issue in its glorious technicolour, because that's what we're here for. Thank you. I just wanted to add to that something that we're doing. We're working, one of the programmes we work in is education, and we've just released our um, latest set of materials, which start at age four and go up to age 16. But as part of that, we do presentations in schools. And I often think that kids are sort of overlooked as the powerful ambassadors that they really are. And perhaps the climate change strikes have raised that profile. But I'll tell you one story that really makes me think, and we've had a lot of good feedback from kids and from teachers after we've been to the schools. One in particular, where um, I did an assembly and the catering manager of the school came up afterwards and said, look, I'm not gonna stop selling water in plastic bottles in this school. I get a profit of 10,000 pounds a year and I can't do without that. And there's not a lot you can say to that because I knew I didn't have time to tell her about the oceans and everything else. But I got a call from the teacher the following term who said since that assembly, not one child has bought the water from the school shop. So it shows how the kids can be, you know, they can tell the adults, but also at the end of term, one of the teachers bought them all ice creams and they were very excited, but when they opened the box, everyone was in a plastic novelty cone and not one child took the ice cream. So I think they can be really powerful and, and I think education is vital and you can't think, oh, well, it's not fast enough, we've got to wait for them to grow up. They are in positions of power now. Can I just really quickly, sorry, Eric, we've got sitting up here with two people who like to talk. <laughs> you <laughs> were more forceful about talking, okay. Um, the thing that I just wanted to say was that I get asked a lot when I do presentations and stuff, I get a lot, a lot of adults say to me, you need to be talking to the children. And I say, well, I don't because um, I'm not very good at talking to children. But I, I often find that we are a little bit scared to talk to adults as well. And we do need to have conversations with each other. So there's all this en energy around the climate movement, which is absolutely brilliant. And I think we need to listen more. But I also think that we should be less scared to have different conversations with adults who do not share our point of view and to actually just have a disagreement, a friendly disagreement, it's all right. But we, we can't just um, ignore the fact that a lot of people are missing quite seminal points in their education about this stuff. And in my experience, people are quite um, keen to learn. So if you get a chance to socialize your science, I think that's really, really important. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's because I don't entirely agree with you, actually. So I thought, let's... Yeah, exactly. So now I'm keeping it. 
No, so so I fully agree with you um, about the idea um, that 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 the, the plastic problem can be a gateway problem towards the bigger climate problem, right? And and um, I say that also often, and I, I fully agree with it. But I think we have to be a bit care careful not to make plastic the enemy, because yeah. it could also be that. And I've once said this at, 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 Greenwich, uh, at Greenpeace headquarters, and they hated me for it. I, I, mean, I said, we can't solve the climate problem without using more plastic. Uh, okay. That's a preposition. I'm not sure if it's entirely true, but there's certainly something where there are a lot of good things about plastic that actually very much help combat climate change, right? So by just making plastic the enemy, I sometimes worry that we might actually be going a bit too far and actually be detrimental in, our, in, in, in other things. So I think that the real enemy is not the plastic, the real enemy is the uh, waste management system. That is, of course, where all the trouble happens. Um. I'm, I'm gonna say something about waste management now. <laughs> I think um, a lot of people who don't understand how little plastic gets recycled anyway still see recycling as the answer. So they will keep buying water in plastic bottles, even though they can get it from a tap. Uh, because they recycle it, but you can't keep recycling plastic. So we can't recycle our way out of this. If you could recycle a plastic bottle maybe 10 times, the new idea of putting 25% recycle it into that will reduce that by half. So then what do we do? We can't keep recycling plastic. We will end up with park benches all over the place and decking. I just don't want to do that film again. I just don't want to make that film again where I go and see the park bench being made. I've done it like 10 times. The, I, don't think, I don't think plastic is the enemy, and I don't talk about it in that way. And one of the reasons we don't talk about it that way is because we were told very early on, we actually had letters from a lovely guy who runs a small plastic manufacturing facility saying, stop demonizing plastic. We want you to come and see us. So we actually filmed with these people. And one of the things that I think we need to do to move it from being a spotlight and an expose to a conversation, one of the things I think would be great to do as civil society is to come up with a list of what we think plastics are important for and get rid of the crap that we know is not important. But that would be an amazing dialogue and that would really be something that would show me that we've moved it into a conversation, which is what we try and do is create a conversation. Thank you. I think we've got one time for another couple of questions. Oh. You had your hand up first. Ooh. Right over there in the corner, thank you. Uh, yes, there is, I, th I think what we should consider is that regardless how much plastic we recycle, that will not, let's say, either make the problem of ocean plastic worse or better. It's the amount of plastic that in the end ends up in the ocean, either through river or through airborne stuff or so. And Let's say we are, we are now talking about a, let's say, rich European point of view about having actually also the possibility of recycling, but where most of the plastic ends up in the ocean, there is basically no trash uh, disposal system whatsoever. And I think that is the, ma the major problem. So actually, if people are incinerating their plastic in their backyard, which might be very bad for, let's say, inhaling that, is actually a good thing for the ocean. But I mean, obviously, we, we cannot really promote that uh, because I mean, people shouldn't inhale uh, plastic fumes from from burning. But but I think that the problem is that we are producing so much plastic wrapping. It's it's not about the. I mean, the recycling is obviously important, but it's not to to let the stuff end up in the environment. That is the key issue that we need to address in this. And also, just adding to this, because you showed that in your presentation with this PETase, so with this uh, enzyme. I mean, this is something that always pops up in the news, and once that uh, happened last year around this, um, I think it was around this uh, time of the year, I was asked by many Dutch uh, newspapers about what my point of view about this is and, and whether now the ocean plastic problem is solved. But I mean, what, what people don't realize, and I think this is something where also the, let's say, the, the press and then, let's say, uh, also sorts of documentaries could really help is, like to show how big the ocean is. And I mean, how do you want to do this? How do you want to bring an enzyme to all the plastic pieces that are floating in the ocean, at the surface, at the coast, in the deep sea? I mean, how do you want to do this? And how many tons of uh, enzyme would that be, even if it was that omnipotent enzyme? I mean, that, that is something that is impossible to do. And this is something where I wasn't people... recommending it. I was showing it as an example, A, of the way that people responded to those news stories. So coming to me and saying, great, we don't have to do anything anymore. And then B, how uh, some of the 
uh, responses were informed by uh, uh, science fiction stories around enzymes before. So I'm, I'm in no way like a... I'm not trying to market enzymes or no, anything. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to say that, but I think it would be great if you would pick this up in, in your, uh, let's say, in, in your uh, documentaries and in, in the yeah. way on how you communicate with what you call the normal people yeah. um, to transmit, like, well, we, we are living on the Earth's surface, which is, is only a, a tiny fraction of our entire planet. The ocean is rather big. We cannot just go there and rake through it and then yeah. it's cleaned up or so. It's, it's a problem yeah. that will persist for, for some time. And also, like, there, there is no magic wand option of, of throwing something out, and then it's like, clata, everything is cleaned up. I mean, that is somehow how it, how it will never work. I mean, it is about not dumping stuff in the ocean. Exactly. It's a hard story to tell, though, because it's very hard to get. It's, you know what? It's been too hard to get the reality commissioned and to get it on screen, because people are like, yeah, but what's the solution? We don't want to leave people feeling, oh, my God. <laughs> And it's only when people have been brave enough to break through and, and actually make their own content where they're just, you know, where you're just showing it how it is, <laughs> that, that we really get uh, an honest conversation. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, what I'm producing is a product, right? And it's done to a lot of different people's specifications. So I'm trying my best to try and show the myriad issues around this subject. But I also have to mould... The, what I want to say to make it fit a format which is going to get in front of people. If the gateways, if the barriers were all removed and we could say what we want, then we'd be in a really interesting place. And we'd be showing your film like every night. <laughs> I will. Um, are we right? Have you got anything oh, to I'm say? Just, I'm just going to pick up one point. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting the look. I'm talking too much. You were talking about how the people are responsible who are letting it go into the oceans in places where there's no waste management. I think that responsibility, a lot of it has to come back to the, way, to the West uh, in developed countries who, knowing that those people had no waste management situation, were still sending all our waste out of there because we didn't want it. And I think that's, I think that's bordering on criminal, that we should do that, destroy their countries because we didn't want that mess in ours. And that, morally that, repugnant. Yes, morally repugnant. But there is an, there's an early day motion going through the UK, going through the UK House of Commons at the moment with 40 MPs, and I, I understand you know we're locked in a rather iterative process at the moment, which nothing's getting through. But but there are um, there's cross party support for an early day motion which will outlaw the exporting of plastic waste, and we need, that's the kind of thing that we need. Thank you. We're going to end it there, if that's all right, because we do have a coffee break. We could be here for a long time. These three will be available. Just before you move, we do have another, the second half of the session starts at quarter past four. It'll be discussing a lot of what the, the conversation has been around here in terms of the next stage. So we have some speakers, um, Hanley, who has um, been fantastic at connecting people with the natural world to instill behaviour change. We also have Hugo Tagkov from Surface Against Sewage who will be demonstrating how community action can really have a massive um, impact. We also have Ed Mitchell from Tepenon Group, who is involved in that circular economy and really value, it can explain to us how we really need to be valuing plastic as a resource and not a throwaway waste. So please join us again at quarter past four. We'll see you then. Thank you.
someone who brings it to me, but not now. I mean, they, they're not here. <laughs> Where are you staying now? Do you want to sit here? Sorry? Where are you sitting? Uh, I think, um, okay, now maybe I sit here because I can change the, all the presentation since they're all here, so I can. Yeah, sure. It will be simpler now. Yeah. I just have to press start presentation every time. Easy. It's much easier. And then the microphone is also closer to you. We just, I just spoke to Hanley, who's the first speaker. She said if we leave it a couple of minutes late, okay. to give some people some time okay. to come because she might not need to talk for the whole time. Which are a person you're responsible for keeping the time. <laughs> Actually, no, they told me to remind you if, like, if we go, like, if we run <laughs> really, really late. Like, I should tell you. I think because um, <laughs> Joe finished a little bit early, so yeah. Lucy could go a little bit early. Okay, okay, okay. And I get my glamorous assistant to help me with that. session clashes with the poster session for uh, science on plastics. Really? No, yeah. it doesn't make sense. I know. It does not make sense, but it does. So, sadly, we've lost some of our... And they, like, posters got an advantage because they have, like, wine, beer, and, and everything, so... <laughs> who would stay here? <laughs> these heroes. Oh, if we knew, All we would have bought some wine. <laughs> so you're not presenting anything? Me no. Well, do you know my friend who lives in St Agnes made this for me by hand? Go in my house, son. Sorry, thank you. draw them in. You ready? Just we'll draw them in. You can draw them in. Hmm? Okay. I want these ready because the presenter is going to use one of the microphones to talk. Okay. Any of these? Yeah, they are ready. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second half of our session on plastics. Um, for those of you who were here earlier, uh, welcome back. And for those of you who were not here earlier at another session, thank you for joining us. The first half of the session, um, we talked about the, pub the awareness of plastic, so some of the science, and then how that's been communicated, and how the public perception of that has been changing over the last uh, couple of years. What we're doing, uh, what we're aiming to do in this session, is to really show the power of how that information can drive real change. So we have three incredible speakers for you this afternoon. 
And our first one is um, Hanley Prinslow. Hanley is a professional freediver. She uh, absolutely is more the most passionate person about the ocean, if you can imagine that. And she uses that passion to really engage people who don't, maybe don't have that privilege to be able to connect with, with nature, to be able to draw them to the ocean through her charity, I Am Water. And then from that, instill an absolute love of nature through that experience in the hope that they will then be motivated then to care for the ocean in their own area where they live. So I'd like to welcome to stage, please, Hanley Prinslow. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm sure you've had a very, very long day of um, cerebral activity. So to zoom in a little bit, we've seen some amazing footage shared from space and some incredible data from around the world. But to zoom in a little bit on your specific organism, yourself, um, I invite you to sit comfortably and cross your legs if they are crossed, please so that you can sit comfortably. And I'd like you for just a few seconds to start focusing on your breathing. One of our most obvious, obvious reflexes in the human body is to breathe. From the moment we are born, we take a breath in till the moment we take our last breath out. We do it without really thinking about it. So let's think about it for a bit. I'd like you to close your eyes and to bring your right hand onto your belly. And now as you inhale, I'd like you to feel your hand getting pushed away with your breath in. So you're breathing into your stomach. And as you exhale, your hand drops back down. And in. And out. And keeping your eyes closed and keeping this rhythm of your breath flowing, I'd like you to, in your mind's eye, travel through time and remember either your first or a very early memory of water. It could be the ocean, it could be a river, it could even be bath time. and spend some time just experiencing what that was, exploring that memory. Take one last big breath in. And exhale to open your eyes. So the human body is a reflexive breather. All day, every day, we breathe. And many a thing that we don't do consciously, our body does, does with the least possible effort, the law of least effort. And so very often you'll find yourself breathing with only the upper part of your lungs or not breathing very properly at all and starting to suffer from tension in your shoulders and an actual not 100% oxygen saturation because of how we breathe. So we're sitting here in Vienna today in a very artificial space. It feels hard unless we're imagining and throwing our memories back in time to bring ourselves back to what we're talking about here. So many of the conversations today, when we're talking about plastics, tracking them, how they are constructed, how they should be managed, a lot of why we are talking about this problem is because the growing realization of what it's doing to our oceans. And we're in a landlocked city to get to the closest ocean is over four and a half hours drive. So why is it relevant? Why is it relevant that we should care about how much plastic is in our ocean or how well our ocean is doing or whether or not our oceans will survive? You might know this, but more than 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from our ocean. So when we were doing our exercise earlier, at least every second breath you took, that oxygen is from the ocean. 
And I'm a firm believer in us needing the ocean, not only because our actual survival depends on it, but what would we actually be if we didn't protect this great wilderness? What would that say about us as a species if we cannot take care of 70% of our planet? The blue bit that should always have been called planet ocean, it should never have been called planet Earth. Your body is around 70% water, our planet is around 70% water. We cannot ignore the fact that we need the ocean and that we are connected to it. So my background is in competitive freediving. For many years, I spent my time swimming up and down a rope along a black line at the bottom of a swimming pool, exploring how long I could stay underwater. As a child, I dreamt of being a mermaid. I grew up on a horse farm outside Pretoria in South Africa, so it wasn't very obvious that I'd want to be a mermaid. But my sister and I would swim underwater in the dams and the rivers on the farm and dream of being underwater. And when I found out about this sport, free diving, I realized this is the expression of what I've always dreamt of, of being one with water and being underwater on one breath. The photo on the left there is during a competition in the Red Sea in a, comp a competitive discipline called constant weight no fins, which means however much weight I'm carrying on me in my weight belt or my neck weight, which you can see there, I have to bring back up with me. And in that discipline, I've been down to 56 meters and up again, swimming breaststroke. I've held my breath for over six minutes and dived up and down with a monofin to around 70 meters. And this, these aren't even world records today. This is 10 years ago when I was at the top of the freediving world. And how is it possible to hold our breath for so long? People say to me, I don't have very big lungs. I could never be a freediver. Or this is one I love that I hear all the time. Yes, but freediving, we don't belong in the ocean. We're, we're terrestrial beings. And if you haven't heard of something called the mammalian dive response, I'd like to share that with you today and start bringing us closer and closer and closer to this point of understanding how interlinked we are with the ocean, not only its well-being, but our actual essence. So I'd like to call this our inner seal. And this is me in Cape Town where I live, surrounded by Cape fur seals. And this research was first done on free divers because it was discovered in seals, Waddell and elephant seals. So when we hold our breath, when you step back into the ocean or into water for that matter, the first thing that happens when your face touches the water is that your heart rate slows down, bradycardia. Brad is slowing down cardio of the heart rate to conserve oxygen. The second thing that happens is vasoconstriction. As the carbon dioxide levels in your blood goes up, all the blood vessels in your arms and legs constrict and flush the blood back to the core where it's needed to feed the brain. That's vasoconstriction. And finally, I don't know how many of you have ever consciously thought of your spleen. Everybody still have their spleen? It's not a trick question. Sometimes spleens can be removed after traumatic accidents because, spoiler alert, they bleed incessantly. The spleen is a sponge-like storage space for hemoglobin, oxygen-rich hemoglobin. And when we're freediving and holding our breath in the same way that seals and dolphins and whales do, your spleen constricts to about half its original size and releases this oxygen-rich hemoglobin into your bloodstream, which has been diverted back to where it's needed for your brain. And so we step into water and our bodies remember. Our bodies remember water. So whether you're sitting behind a desk all day or in a conference center in Vienna and you feel removed from the ocean or from the aquatic, you never are. Your body is connected to the ocean. You are an aquatic being, let alone that every second breath you take is from the ocean. So, as I progressed through my competitive freediving career, I was given the opportunity to travel and encounter the very enigmatic large giants that live in our ocean. As part of conservation projects around the world, I was invited to freedive with the giants, sometimes, like in this case, to create scale of how big they are. 
and sometimes to be a voice for the plight that they face. So this whale shark is in Ecuador, and we were there not to dive with whale sharks, and she completely surprised us, appearing out of the depths. And when you look down on the back of a whale shark, it's like a galaxy of stars, those white dots on that dark blue back. And in Madagascar, the Malagasy word for whale shark is Marokintana, which means a great galaxy. This is one of my favorite whale shark encounters in the world, is swimming with the Malagasy and hearing them speak of how they're swimming with the stars. This photo here is from Baja, Mexico, uh, one of my favorite places on the planet called Cabo Pulmo, where a small fishing village realized one man, Mario, said to his dad, we can't keep fishing. We are running out of fish. And Mario's dad said to him, that is impossible. The ocean is full of fish. We'll never run out of fish. And this was 30 years ago. And Mario said, dad, in my lifetime, in my son David's lifetime, we will not be able to live off the ocean anymore. And Mario learned how to become a scuba diving instructor and he brought tourists back. And he showed his village how they could live off a way where not a single fish has to be harmed and they can be paid before even setting out to the ocean. This photo here is what that kind of protection looks like. If we're talking about really impacting the well-being of our oceans, we have to talk about absolute protection. Not quotas, <laughs> not species-specific, absolute protection. Areas where you cannot extract anything from the ocean. And if we commit to that, we can dive down into tornadoes of fish that surround you, that move off like one. It's like being invited into this scales of mercury that circles around you. And as you dive down, you get enclosed by fish. And there are only a handful of places in the world where you can still experience this amount of biomass. And this school of fish was found by Mario's son, David, standing in the front of the boat. David is now 27 years old and is the skipper of the boat that takes us out to free dive with the fish. And he stands in the front and he says, I can smell them. They're close. And his father's vision to protect this area where their family has lived for generations and generations has allowed his son the chance to be able to smell where the fish are and put people like myself and you, if you want to travel there, in a picture of what conservation looks like. This is literally a stone's throw from my house in Cape Town. How many of you have been to Cape Town? Yes. I'm sure many of you climbed the mountain, tasted the wine, tried the food. People come to Cape Town for many, many valid reasons. But one of the few things that people really explore when they get in the water, unless it's for great white shark cage diving, is actually seeing what's below the surface. This is what a kelp forest underneath the water looks like. And again, this is what a marine protected area looks like. This is a seven gill shark in the Castle Rock Marine Reserve in the False Bay coast of South Africa in Cape Town. And this seven gill shark is over three meters and this species is like swimming fossils. They've been around for a very, very, very long time. And if we play our cards right, they might just be here for a very, very long time to come. So, this is from an expedition in um, Sri Lanka where Jo experienced her punami with the, the blue whales. And I was in Sri Lanka to swim with blue whales, to have this experience of swimming with the largest of all creatures ever. And we were out on a small, small fishing boat. There weren't any real operators at that time. The boat had a nine horsepower motor we were going far, far, far out to find this place where the trench drops down, where the whales often come by on the eastern side of Sri Lanka. And suddenly, around our little boat was the only effect I could use to describe it was like a popcorn of whales. I don't know if that's a good collective pronoun, but it was a popcorn of whales. Suddenly around it was just this poof, 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 poof. And over 60 sperm whales surfaced around us and just rested at the surface like giant gray logs breathing. And I looked at my friend and photographer I was there with, and I said, 
I have to get in the water. And he was like, sperm whales. We're not here to swim with sperm whales, but, you know, we have the permits. Yeah, okay, well, yes, okay, go. And more than anything, for those of you who know about sperm whales, is they are so intelligent, we don't quite really know how to describe their intelligence. We don't really have the words to talk about how intelligent they are. I slipped into the water and I realized, whatever happens now, I have to try and communicate with this animal that I am friend. So I hung in the water and just thought and felt, I'm so grateful to be here. You're so large. Thank you. I'm so grateful to be here. You're so large. Thank you. And it's not just a body language thing. It's an energy in the water thing. And if you've been in the water with cetaceans, you pick it up. And these two large female sperm whales turned to me and started scanning. And the echolocation of a sperm whale is one of the strongest, strongest echolocations in the world. The US military have been studying them to try and understand how to have that kind of penetration through water. They can stun giant squid at depth in order to hunt them. So of course I'm hoping <laughs> that they consider me friend. And they turn and they start scanning me with this echolocation and it's this tick, 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 like a small sledgehammer on my chest being scanned. And then they turned and they looked at me and slowly swam past, looking into that large wrinkled eye, knowing that there is somebody very, very intelligent home. And as one, this huge pod took a breath in and they started diving down three kilometers deep where we were to hunt the giant squid at depth. And at the top of this photo, you can see a small, light-colored squiggle with a monofin on, that's me, to give you an idea of scale. And I swam down for about 30 meters into the blue with the whales, and with a feeling of being bereft, I watched them disappear into the blue beneath me, swimming back up to breathe. And out of the blue, the small gray figure appears, swimming towards me, and this baby sperm whale comes right up to me and puts his head against my chest and then starts playing. And I've heard that when sperm whale pods have a baby that's too small to dive down for the hunt, they'll leave the baby at the surface with a caretaker or a babysitter, a young whale that will take care of the baby while they dive. On this day, there wasn't another whale in sight, and I guess for some reason I was the elected babysitter. And for the hour, that the adult whales hunted, I got to play. I would dive down, and then the little whale would come down, and little, still being three times my size, and then we'd swim around each other, and then of course I would have to breathe again and go back up, and the little whale would be, you are pathetic. You have to breathe again, and I would sneak a few breaths and then dive down again. And we swam helixes around each other, understanding this shared space, the shared blue that can hold us both. And at the end of this experience, being able to swim belly to belly, and with any animal, this is our most vulnerable, our most exposed, and to get invited to a belly to belly experience with a wild animal is a gift. And this very much embedded in me, the concept that we live on a shared planet. It is not a human planet. I even go so far as to say that it is arrogant to call ourselves the custodians of it. It's not ours. Yes, we have to do what we can to protect it. Yes, we have to do more. But we are given the opportunity to share it with so many other species, and we're not being very good friends at this point in time. And traveling, diving with whales, sharks, mantas, fish tornadoes, all the big sharks, the whites, the tigers, the hammers, the bulls. If there's something that I always communicate about sharks is that the way we think about risk is completely archaic. With the visibility of this water in the Bahamas where I swam with this tiger shark, the experience I have with sharks, understanding their behavior, having the visibility where I can see them approaching and building that relationship where Emma, 
this tiger shark, can approach me and I can interact with her in a way that communicates that I am not food. This is far, far less risky than many of the things we are practicing today. We are living in a very warped sense of risk today. And swimming with sharks is probably the least risky thing I do on a daily basis. Sharks are predictable. Humans, terrifyingly unpredictable. This is a giant manta ray, Manta barostris. Up until around 10 years ago, we were still believing that there was only one species of manta, Manta alfredi, the reef manta. But while some mantas wingspan up to this individual seven meters, one has been measured at nine meters. It's like a small airplane. And the, man the reef mantas that you often see in Indonesia or the Maldives and some other places are much, much smaller. A couple of manta researchers started taking DNA, doing a whole bunch of tests. Oh yeah, no, they're completely different species, completely different. This 70% of our planet that is blue truly is our last wilderness. We have so much of it left to explore. And one of the reasons I am so passionate about protecting the ocean is because I truly believe that there is so much left to fight for. Just what we know and what we've seen is breathtaking in its magnificence. The power of awe, books have been written about the power of awe. Nothing instills it in us more than being in this wild ocean landscape. All hope is not lost. There has a lot left to fight for. And as what was being discussed earlier with Blue Planet 1 showing a perfect ocean and Blue Planet 2 showing, oh, actually, we might have turned the camera away a little bit. There's actually quite a lot not so great in the ocean. Let's talk about it. A lot of the photos I've shown you today is my absolute golden moment experiences. But then you have days like this, where I'm diving in Indonesia with clients, teaching them free diving, and then taking them to swim with the, the reef manta rays. And it's magnificent to see a manta ray flying through the ocean, technically flying through the ocean, and Mantas are filter feeders, so when they open their mouth, they literally just funnel water through their mouth. Over 30 liters a second. That's remarkable. And that's a manta alfredi. Do you wanna escape the, let's try it again. So when manta rays filter feed, they set a trajectory and they swim and they feed to the extent where if you're in the water with them, you have to get out of the way or they'll swim straight into you. It's a kind of like a feeding trance almost. And the amount of water they're filtering, when you're in the water and you see plastic pollution in the water, it's okay, if you can't make it work, don't worry about it. <laughs> we tested it and it worked. They're now starting to do actual tests on the, the tissues of manta rays to start looking at what is happening with them ingesting so much plastic. Because with this, what we now like to call plastic soup that's in the ocean, creatures like filter feeders are incredibly vulnerable ingesting all this water and having all this plastic instead of plankton and small fish, that being their, their food source. Okay, one more try. After the big manta, here we go. It's okay, we'll go to the next one. So, um, in that video, what you would have seen is, I have a group of clients with me and we're swimming with the manta rays, and I was so disturbed by how much plastic there was that one of the boat captains, I was picking up so much plastic out of the water, literally trying to swim in front of the mantas, grabbing plastic floating all around, that he threw me the sack that they usually sell rice in. And for three hours, I swam around like some kind of apocalyptic Santa Claus, just diving down, diving down, swimming up and down, grabbing plastic and putting it into this huge rice bag that 
I had to empty on the boat every 20 minutes. I was filling it at such a rate. And then watching these magnificent manta rays circling around us. And that's where they feed, that's where they go. They don't have many other choices, right? They can't say, oh, this is bay is really dirty today. Let's go to that other bay where we also feed. They feed there. And I think considering the intelligence of the creatures we get to share this planet with, if there's one thing that makes us unique is that we have choices. And that our choices matter, not just for us, but for the other species we share this planet with. This photo here is from a very deep, dark fjord in Sweden for a competition in freediving I did, going down to 60 meters on this day. At the surface of the water, the visibility was about six meters or so, and the temperature was about 15 degrees Celsius. At 60 meters, it's pitch black dark and four degrees Celsius. So what the, the organizers would do is put additional ropes down so that when I get down to the bottom or when us competitors get down, we can open our eyes, grab the tag that we have to take back up with us to show that we've been to a certain depth, and also to not be down in the dark. So there's these ropes with lights and there's lights on the bottom of the rope. So I'm at the surface doing my breathe up. I take my big final breath in, expand my lungs, and I start my dive. And for about 20 meters, I kick, equalize, kick, equalize, kick, equalize. At about 25 meters, I'm heavy enough that I don't have to kick anymore. So I just fill my chipmunk cheeks with air save that air, equalize, 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 and just drop, 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 and I close my eyes to just focus on this falling. I'm attached to the rope by a lanyard, like a leash that attached me with a carabiner to the rope, so that as I close my eyes, I don't get lost in this great black ocean. Eventually, I feel my leash hit the bottom of the, of the rope, and I open my eyes to grab my tag, and it is pitch black. I touch my face, I can't see my hand before I knock myself, and immediately I think to myself, I've gone blind. Something has happened in my optic nerve with the pressure and the temperature and something, they haven't done research on this before. I'm going to be a statistic of what happens at depth in cold, on cold water, on freedivers, and what causes blindness. And then I think, I'm so addicted to exploration, to the beauty of these animals I meet, to the sport I practice, I don't want to live blind. So at 60 meters depth, at four degrees Celsius, in dark water, I decide, that's it, I'm done. I start undoing my carabiner, I'm gonna let go and just drop down. The fjord is over 100 meters deep, there's currents down there, I've had a good run, I'm not going back up blind. So as I start undoing the carabiner, I remember my dad's cousin, Renette, who was born blind, and throughout my childhood, I was jealous of her relationship with her black Labrador called Friday. And I thought to myself, I'll get a Labrador. I'll get a dog and we will have that close relationship that people have with their guide dogs and that will be a new way of expressing my love of other species. And I'm, I click my carabiner back onto the rope. I take my tag for good measure. I start swimming back up and I think to myself, shall I get a golden lab or a black lab? There's also chocolate Labradors, but they're quite rare. Maybe I'll get a chocolate Labrador and I'm swimming up, swimming up, swimming up. At about 20 meters, the light starts filtering back. My safety diver, Anneli, is like, where have you been? You know, because for a minute or so longer than my normal dive time, I was contemplating my demise. And I come back up to the surface. I take off my mask. I do my surface protocol. Within 15 seconds from coming up from a free dive, you have to take off your mask, show an okay sign, and say, I'm okay. If you can't do it in that order, in that time, you're disqualified. So I say that to the judge. I get my white card, I did my 60 meter dive, and the organizer leans over the side of the boat and he says, so um, was it dark down there? Because I think we forgot to change the batteries in the torches. Yeah. And that day, 
<laughs> I really, really realized that at any given moment, at any time, you have to pick your own story. You have to pick your story. And you have to pick what you want to believe. Because you don't have to believe everything you think. Don't have to believe everything you think. And I think that's a really helpful thing to hold on to, how we pick our stories as we navigate our way through this landmine of challenges when it comes to something in my world like ocean conservation. And for me, this compelled me to realize that I have to protect what I love. This drift net that I'm holding on to was over 100 kilometers long and only five minutes from the baby sperm whale I played with. And I have to create meaning. What does it mean for me to protect what I love? How can I make that love visible? So in 2010, I started the I Am Water Foundation, and we work with thousands of children every year who live within walking distance of the, of the ocean. They can see it from their house. And this little video is an example of a girl called Simam Kele, and in her own words, what that means. <laughs> we have a pattern here. So Simam Kele, as one of our projects, speaks of how the ocean for generations in her community has been something that has belonged to others. Perhaps it's a rich man's paradise, she says. Yes, I'm from South Africa, so we have a history that has perpetuated that certain things have only been for some. But I experienced the same thing in Ecuador, in the Maldives, in Los Angeles. Children who live walking distance to the ocean and have not dipped their faces underwater, have not opened their eyes underwater. To me, this is a travesty, not only because these experiences should be for all and what we know being in nature does for us as whole human beings, but if we believe, like I do, that we protect what we love, how can we expect people to protect something that they've not yet even experienced? I personally don't think that facts and statistics by themselves changes behavior. I think there is an alchemy moment that has to happen when we add caring. Then we can galvanize using facts and statistics for real behavior change. And today, with I'm Water, my full-time job, whether it's children or the paying clients I take on freediving trips around the world, my full-time job is to facilitate people falling in love with the ocean. Because when we add facts and statistics with caring, then we can see true behavior change and lasting behavior change for the good of our oceans and in extension, ourselves. Yeah. Uh, thank you. We gave Can uh, Hanley an extra couple of minutes because of the technical um, difficulties. If we're going to have a, a question session at, after our third speaker, Hugo, if you'd like to come up um, now, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so you'll have an opportunity to ask Hanley some questions at the end. Um, our next speaker is um, Hugo Tagholm. Hugo is Chief Executive of Surfers Against Sewage, which is a marine conservation charity based based in Cornwall, but working much, much wider. Um, Hugo is going to talk to us about the absolute power of engaging communities and what incredible effects that can have on wider reaching themes. Thank you, Hugo. Um, thank you very much, Jess. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me here today to speak. Um, it's a, a pretty hard um, act to follow on from, from Hanley. Um, a, a, a true legend and an amazing inspiration to us all um, in terms of her interaction with um, this huge wildlife we see in our beautiful oceans. So uh, 
So yeah, really inspirational stuff. Um, we, we've had a, 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 an amazing day um, talking around plastics. Um, we've heard a lot about the science, the evidence, uh, the new evidence. Um, we haven't heard so much around the solutions yet, which is something I want to sort of touch on today with the work of Surface Against Sewage. Now, Surface Against Sewage is a, a marine conservation charity that's based in the UK. Um, our remit is just in the UK, but we've got lots of international affiliates and partnerships. Um, some of you might say, why, why are you called Surface Against Sewage and why are you talking about plastics? We did think about changing our name to Surface Against Plastics, but the acronym just didn't quite work for us, so we, we abandoned that idea. My, um, my sort of love affair with the ocean started in the great maritime city of of London on sea. This is actually me and my brothers um, down on the foreshores of the Thames. My dad used to take us there mudlarking um, when we were little kids, looking for all sorts of old stuff that had been chucked into the river by the then busy docking trade. So there would be um, clay pipes, coins, all sorts of things that we'd scavenge for. And what you might see in this picture is um, not just Tower Bridge, but um, the fact that there's no multicolored tide line of plastics that we so often see on our rivers, including the River Thames today. So that's where I started my love affair with the ocean. Today I live down in Cornwall, um, and this is where I drive past every day. Um, this is a, a beach called Perrinport Beach. Um, it's a wave that I love to surf when I can surf. I don't get so much time to surf as much as I want these days but uh, this is a, a beautiful wave. Um, it's also a place that we see some amazing wildlife in the UK. Maybe not as big as the sperm whales or the tiger sharks um, that Hanley swims with, but I've surfed with basking sharks at this spot, the second biggest fish in the sea. Um, sperm whales have come to this beach, seals, dolphins, seabirds of all descriptions come past this beach. And that's where I get my inspiration now, Surface Against Sewage was started some 30 years ago, back in 1990. And as the name suggests, it was started uh, in response to the then chronic sewage pollution that was being pumped out right around the UK. And my predecessors at the organisation took to the streets with their surfboards, in gas masks, in wetsuits, and with a giant inflatable turd that they'd wave around in protest that the then problems that the sewage pollution was causing. They were literally sick of getting sick of going into the oceans. Um, Ed, who's talking after me, might talk a little bit about water quality as well. Um, and it was an amazing campaign. Um, it was a time when, um, the 90s was a time when uh, the people sort of rose up um, very much like they're doing with the climate change debate at the moment. Um, we had people protesting against bypasses, we had people protect, protesting against nuclear um, energy, all sorts of things that were happening at the time. And surfers decided that they wanted to stop this thing that was impacting them directly. In a way, they were the marine indicator species of the time. They were the canary in the coal mine. They were the people at the forefront of this issue. And that's something that we take forward to this day. In the UK, we, we consider ourselves to be one of the most authentic voices of the ocean. We are people and we represent people who live and breathe the ocean. We're not just passive observers of the ocean. Uh, we spend our time hopefully surfing when we can, swimming, enjoying our beaches. And this is what drives us and motivates us to call for change. Now, over the last 30 years, thanks to some amazing campaigning from my former colleagues, thanks to some amazing European legislation that came in um, in the 1990s. We've seen a dramatic improvement in the water quality in the UK. Thanks to the investment from the water companies, we've seen our water quality standards go from what would have been just 27% of our beaches passing in 1990 to what is close to 100% of our beaches passing today. And that's a great testament to effective campaigning, to effective communication, and to effective legislation. Legislation that forced business to do the right thing, to make the right investment, to protect our planet, and put the planet before profits. Now, during the same period of time, 
we've seen the explosion of plastic pollution. And that's now our number one campaigning issue. This is the other end of the beach that I like to surf at, Perrinport. It was just after the storm Hercules in 2014. I took my team down to the beach on this day and in just an hour we collected a thousand plastic bottles, stepping over every other plastic bottle. It really was a terrible scene. And this is something we see more and more today. The plastic pollution crisis um, is here with us um, loudly. Um, I had the good fortune to, to do a presentation with um, James Honeybourne, the executive producer of The Blue Planet 2 recently. Um, and some facts really stayed with me from that. But one stood out above all else, and it's something that Lucy Siegel touched on in her presentation. Out of the seven hours of documentary that The Blue Planet 2 was, only 14 minutes was designated and dedicated to plastic pollution. 14 minutes that has changed how governments are responding to plastic, 14 minutes that changed how industry is responding to plastic, 14 minutes that has changed how NGOs are responding to plastic, and 14 minutes which may well have influenced all of you and driven you to come here today. And it's no surprise that we have a plastic pollution crisis. Another shocking statistic that I often mention um, when giving talks is that between 2002 and 2012, more plastic was produced than in all of time before that. So it's no wonder that we have a plastic pollution crisis and that we see amazing creatures like these two sperm whales washed up onto our beaches, their stomachs filled with plastics, choked by the convenience of our single-use lifestyles. We all find ourselves trapped in a plastic economy, with more and more plastic being produced, and I believe that it's actually, the, the production levels are actually going to quadruple by 2050. We've got our systems that are bursting with the sheer volume of plastic that is being created. And we haven't had the right systems given to us to contain and control and recycle that plastic or eliminate it before it gets into our oceans. So how have Surface Against Sewage responded to this? Well, our journey always starts at the beachfront. It started at the beachfront in 1990 with the water quality issue, surfers getting sick of the sewage pollution that was literally making them ill. And today it starts at the beachfront with the tide line of plastic that our members and our supporters and the public see day in, day out. When I started at Surface Against Sewage back in 2008, we mobilised just a few hundred beach clean volunteers each year. And today, we mobilise over 100,000 volunteers to take action at the beachfront, contributing an estimated 300,000 hours of volunteering time to the front line of plastic pollution. Excuse me. Could I just get some water, please? <laughs> Can you just fill that up, please? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Um, sorry about that, I just had a funny turn there. I'm not sure why. Um, um, so we mobilise about 300,000 volunteers um, each 
uh, 100,000 volunteers each year, contributing about 300,000 hours of volunteering time to taking direct action, picking up plastic at the front line of plastic pollution. But we know that we can't pick our way out of the plastic pollution problem. Just as in 1990 we needed legislation, sorry, sorry. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Just give me two seconds. No, it's all good. I'm just going to move around, actually. That would be better for me. Um, th this has happened to me once before, about three years ago. So maybe, maybe it's starting to be a habit. But um, let, me, let me carry on from the centre of the stage. Maybe it's the lectern that's putting me off. I don't know. Anyway, so we mobilise all these volunteers. But we know we can't just pick our way out of the problem. Just as in 1990, we didn't advocate all of our members going out onto the beach with mops to mop up the sewage pollution, we can't expect the public to pick our way out of the plastic pollution problem. So we're bringing them together to influence people further upstream. This is me with our Environment Minister, Therese Coffey, at a beach clean. Beach cleans are really effective at signposting um, the solutions that we need further upstream. And Therese Coffey is in charge of government policy and legislation that can make a real difference to stopping plastic pollution getting onto our beaches in the first place. In fact, this day here was three years ago, um, and it was the start of a really great policy journey with DEFRA, which is the, uh, the, the ministry that she's part of. So at the moment, we've got our Big Spring Beach, beach Clean going on um, right around the country. 600 Beach Cleans events, uh, mobilising about 40,000 volunteers. And as I say, they're not there just to pick up plastic. They're there to monitor the plastic. We're doing what we call um, our Return to Offender campaign at the moment, which is a brand audit of all of the different brands that we find on our tide lines. This is the evidence that government needs to decide where interventions might be best placed. We started Return to Offender about 10 years ago, and the initial way we did it was we'd find plastic pollution on the beach, we'd find the free post address of the company that made that plastic pollution, and we'd send it back to them. So they'd pay for that to go back to them. And we'd say, look, we know you didn't drop this, but you're manufacturing a lot of this stuff, and we want to know what you're doing to stop it arriving on our beaches. Quite a successful campaign. We're no longer using the return to offender method of sending it back to them. But what we are doing is mobilising our beach clean volunteers to collect, collect and collate that data so we can use it in the right government consultations. And it just so happens that at this current moment in the UK, we've got a consultation on um, extended producer responsibility, which is a way of making sure that manufacturers are responsible for the full life cycle of their own products, including the end of life of their own packaging. So our 40,000 volunteers will be collecting data on all of the brands they're finding, and we're gonna be submitting that to the government to hopefully stop plastic at source rather than picking it up on our beaches. But we did realize two years ago that not everyone wanted to come out with us to pick up plastic off the beaches. And not everyone actually lives near a beautiful beach where it might be a nice activity to pick up that plastic. Maybe people live in inner cities, maybe in other parts of the country where they're less motivated or have a less motivated community around them to pick up plastic. So we launched a new programme called Plastic Free Communities. This was inspired by the fair trade movement. Um, we realised there was nothing in the plastic space that connected individuals within communities. So we created a five-step programme, connecting individuals with businesses, with schools, with local government, to reduce their collective plastic footprint together, eliminate the unnecessary single-use plastics that were so prevalent and that are still so prevalent in so many communities. And we launched it two years ago with what we thought was a really ambitious target. 125 communities we wanted 
by 2020. Within 18 months, we had 500 communities representing 30 million people working on this programme. Right around the UK, from Hackney in London to the highlands of Scotland. A really incredible programme, inspiring people, bringing people together, connecting people to eliminate unnecessary single-use plastics. Getting together at local supermarkets to unwrap their packaging and give it back at the checkout. To say no to plastics that they didn't want, that they don't need, that we can eliminate from our society. But all of this movement is no good unless we have action further upstream, and particularly in Parliament. And Surface Against Sewage, surprisingly, has the only marine conservation all-party parliamentary group in Westminster. And I came out of a meeting a couple of years ago, and I had a cup of coffee with the chair of our group, a guy called Steve Double, who's an MP in Cornwall. And I realised we were surrounded by single-use plastics. So we needed to hold Parliament to account first. So we did a Freedom of Information request that found that out of 600 MPs in the UK's Parliament, in 2016, they used over 2 million items of single-use plastics. 2 million too many. These are avoidable single-use plastics. So we launched a campaign to call for Parliament to go plastic-free. Within a month, we had hundreds of MPs supporting this campaign, and we had a commitment from the parliamentary estate to go plastic-free, which was an awesome victory. But we use our movement, the movement of Beach Clean volunteers, the 100,000 people we mobilise every year, those 500 plastic-free communities, the millions of people we represent. We use those people, we connect those people to call for change. They can't pick their way out of the problem. We can't rely on school children to clean up the mess after businesses of today. So we need to find ways to stop plastic pollution now. We work very hard on the plastic bag charge in the UK. Now there are some flaws with it, but some of the results are very good. For a small five pence plastic bag charge, we've seen an, a, a 15 billion reduction in the number of plastic bags circulated in the UK. That's 15 billion that are no longer in our environment in one form or other. That's an 85% reduction in the circulation of plastic bags. That's because of legislation that we campaign for alongside other charities. A really big win for us and for the environment. And we're on our next plastic pollution cornerstone species, plastic bottles, reported today in the UK press as the most prevalent item people find in the environment. Now, we use almost 40 million plastic bottles in the UK each and every single day. And only just over half of those make it to be collected for recycling. Whether they're recycled or not is another question. In countries where they have a deposit return scheme, they collect almost 100% of those plastic bottles. So fewer end up in the environment, fewer end up in our oceans, fewer end up in our streets and in our countryside. We launched a campaign and a petition to call for this to be brought in into the UK. And we had about 350,000 people support that. We took those petition signatures to Downing Street and we got a commitment from government to bring this in, which is currently being finalised in terms of the model we'll have in the UK. Um, now, we've heard today that recycling may not be the solution, and I, 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 I agree in part with that. But we can create a, a lower plastic economy through effective recycling. The good thing about a deposit return system is that it enables and promotes domestic recycling. It creates a, a investment in domestic recycling, lowering plastic miles and minimising the amount of plastic that we consume that might escape in other countries where we currently export plastic to. So this has been another big campaign victory for Surface Against Sewage and for the UK and hopefully for our oceans. This was part of the campaign. This was outside Parliament. We had a a warship built out of some of the 50,000 plastic bottles that we had found at Beach Cleans and we took it to Westminster with us um, when we delivered the petition. Um, these sorts of stunts are, are quite um, 
quite central to the DNA of surface against sewage. I wanted to finish um, to look at back at some of the graphs that I think Joe um, showed and that I showed earlier on in this this presentation before I almost fainted. Um, I, uh, we've heard comparisons of, of plastic pollution and climate change, and if we look at the graphs, they're very similar. This is a, a climate graph of climate um, carbon dioxide emissions. We've seen the sort of similar um, graph for plastic pollution. Um, my concern at the moment, um, we've seen some amazing action and we're seeing some, some really good um, engagement. Plastic, is a, uh, plastic awareness is a, a, an all-time high. Um, and climate, climate change awareness has been a, a high for, for a long time now. Um, and we've seen lots of innovation around climate. Solar panels, wind turbines, more efficient engines. But yet, carbon dioxide emissions carry on accelerating around the country, around the world. Um, and so we're still in, in a crisis position. Let's hope that with plastic pollution, we can... Um, we can actually create more of a, a, a bell curve and we can see the drop off at the other side um, because we really do need to reduce the amount of plastic that we're producing. We can't, we can't knowingly keep on producing more plastic whilst animals like those amazing sperm whales are killed and are dying and washing up on our beaches more and more. Most of all, for me, I do it for my son who's on the right here, Darwin, um, who loves coming down to the beach for the beach because he loves surfing with me. Um, and, uh, and his friend on the left there, Ollie, who's an aspiring marine biologist and who is now telling his parents he's anxious daily because of the state of our environment. And so we need to do it for these kids. We need to do it for the future of these kids. And it's up to us. It's incumbent on our governments and businesses now to create the change. It's not to wait for these guys to clean up our mess. So that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Hugo, and thank you for being such a pro and carrying on as you did. I know if you had a choice between fainting or having some water in a plastic cup, we all know you would have happily passed out. <laughs> we'll do some questions again at the end to give you some time to have a bit more water from a non-plastic vessel. Um, so we'd like to welcome the stage, please, um, our final speaker, and we're so grateful that we have Ed Mitchell here. Ed, Ed is going to really bring to life the other side of this issue and the importance about valuing plastic, the essential um, plastic material that we have and, and use in the right applications are, you know, at the very, very least, very, very useful, but of course, in many cases, life-saving as well. Um, so Ed is going to talk to us about valuing it and the importance of a circular economy. He's Director of Environment and Sustainability for the Pennon Group, uh, which is a, a family which, all, uh, which includes uh, organisations like South West Water and also Viridor, which is one of the largest waste companies in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much and welcome, Ed. Thank you very much and a very good afternoon stroke evening. I don't know if uh, I realise, by the way, that I'm between you and your favourite evening beverage, so I will keep it fairly... Uh, short. I noticed in Lucy's presentation that when she was showing that picture of the fridge and all the plastic items in there, the only thing I saw was the big bottle of vodka on the back shelf, uh, <coughs> which perhaps is saying where my head's at. Anyway, uh, I will uh, try and bring to life some of the practical aspects of uh, running a recycling business and uh, working in the environment and environmental infrastructure on a commercial basis. So, uh, as you very kindly said, I work for a company called Pennon. It's a company listed on the UK Stock Exchange. It, it owns Southwest Water uh, and also Viridor. And we've got assets of about um, 6 billion and a workforce of, of 5,000 people. And just to pick up on what Hugo was saying about, um, you know, it's not that long ago in the southwest of England that almost half of all our effluent went straight out to sea without treatment. So 30 years ago, uh, literally 45% of the sewage in the southwest of England went straight out to sea. And it's, uh, as you rightly said, Hugo, through a combination of public opinion, 
strong legislation at an EU level and uh, um, the will of Parliament in the UK, but also the two billion investment that a company like Southwest Water was able to raise from, raise from investors uh, in order to make uh, that and to clean up the environment of the Southwest. And just for those of you who are not all that familiar, Southwest Water uh, covers the uh, dark blue peninsula in the bottom left-hand corner of the UK. Viridor is uh, all over the UK, up in Scotland, in Wales, uh, and England as well. So I think the, the thing for me that's come out of some amazing presentations this afternoon, I'm, unfortunately I didn't get here, despite getting up at half past four, didn't manage to get here for the morning uh, slots, but uh, this for me is about the wrong stuff being in the wrong place. So absolutely there is a, a need for us all to reduce the amount of plastic we use and to use plastic uh, where necessary and not use it where not necessary. But I think, as somebody said earlier on, for me, this isn't about demonising plastic. This is about using plastic where it's appropriate and making sure that it ends up in the right place. And we have a legal and a moral responsibility to look after the environment in the southwest of England, our home, but also beyond. And one of the great things about living in the southwest is the, the underpinning of the, 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 the natural environment provides for the economy down there is very, very self-evident. You know, you're at any stage uh, fairly close to some fantastic beaches. Uh, like Hugo, although probably rather worse, I enjoy getting in those beaches, doing a bit of surfing. The whole of the economy of the Southwest relies on those pristine beaches and that pristine natural environment. And, and sometimes I think we forget as society that the whole of society and the whole of our economy does rely on the natural environment. But at least in the Southwest of England, it's relatively evident. And just to pick up on some of the earlier comments about plastics being in the right place and having benefit. Now, this was uh, based on some research done by the Environment Agency uh, a little while ago. Um, and I'm going to make, by the way, also the link, picking up on some earlier conversations, the link between plastics and uh, carbon and therefore climate change, because I think that's a really important area that we only started to touch on. So uh, a 500 milli milliliter plastic water bottle has a carbon footprint of about 83 grams, four of those, and you can drive a mile in, in your car. And uh, according to the World Economic Forum, plastics production, so about 6% of global oil demand at the minute fuels plastics. But by 2050, as other parts of the economy, other parts of society decarbonise, plastics might well, according to the World Economic Forum, be responsible for 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So there is that very important linkage with carbon and climate change. But I really think you can't just say that plastics is bad. So this is some analysis, as I say, done by the Environment Agency, looking at single-use plastic bags, Bags for life, as they're called in the UK, I don't know what you call them elsewhere, but bag, uh, reusable plastic bags, also woven uh, plastic bags and, and cotton bags. And you can see that you have to use, for instance, a cotton bag some 130 times before in the round it is more environmentally friendly than using a single-use plastic bag. Now, I'm in no way advocating for, for using single-use plastic bags. I'm a, I'm, my house is full of um, uh, bags for life and that in a way is the problem because I still go to the shops I won't use a single plastic, use plastic bag I won't pay the 5p but I will pay 10 pence to buy a bag for life and then I don't forget to take it with me and before you know it I've probably got 20 of these things at home and, and my own personal carbon footprint around my shopping habits is starting to look not very clever if you look at the, the environmental implications in the round of, for instance, using cotton with all the pesticides and the water use and the dyes and the, the bleaches, uh, that uh, has a big impact on this graph that you can see in front of you. And research from the United States found that plastic bags generate 39% less greenhouse gas emissions than uncomposted plastic paper bags and 68% less greenhouse gas emissions than composted paper bags. So, 
again, we just need to be careful that we are taking good decisions in the round. And at the end of the day, this is all about all of our behaviours and the choices that we make at home. And I think picking up on the earlier conversation about how you engage people and the public, we have to recognise how consumers act in the real world and how far you can move the vast majority of consumers. And it's absolutely fantastic what has happened on the back of Blue Planet and uh, Surfers Against Sewage, which I've been a proud member for many, many years, uh, their campaigning uh, and, the, and the many other campaigns uh, that are running. That film, if you get a chance to watch it tomorrow, is, whilst distressing in places, a really excellent film, which really makes you pause and think. But the problem is the vast majority of our fellow human beings are not pausing and not thinking. And we have to, to a degree, go to where the people are, find solutions that people can actually engage with and can, can make work in their own lives and, and work out how to keep plastics out of the environment. So around half of all plastic packaging in, is recycled in the UK. That's better than nothing, but obviously a long, a long way short of where it should be. Other materials such as paper, glass and metals have much higher recycling rates. And some packaging in the UK is uh, lost to the environment, absolutely no doubt about that, through littering and through other things. And there was a really uh, great graph very early on in the presentations this afternoon of the amount of plastics released, um, used and the amount kept within control and the amount lost to the environment. Uh, and although the sliver in the UK and across most of Europe is a, is a relatively small sliver, we can't ignore the fact that we are losing some plastics to the environment. We rely in the UK on people and businesses putting plastics that can be recycled into the right bin. The UK has curbside recycling systems, usually for mixed plastics, and does not currently have a deposit return scheme, which uh, Hugo's just talked about a minute ago. Plastic that can't be recycled, once collected, either goes to landfill or goes to energy recovery. Now, interesting thing that made me pause for thought is putting plastics in landfill, you could argue, is a way of sequestering carbon. It'll still be there in a thousand years' time, and you'll have locked that carbon back in, but it doesn't feel right. And I think there's a lot of this is about what, what, what it feels like as a citizen, what we feel we should be doing, as some of the other speakers have just much more eloquently than me um, uh, explained. In the UK, like everywhere else in Europe, we're moving away from landfill with many more energy recovery facilities as the solution where you can't, fully, where you can't recycle it. There is absolutely no market for plastic films and other low-grade plastics. So the only answer, the only commercial answer, the only viable answer at the minute is you either put them in the landfill or you burn them. And for me, burning them is, uh, has some advantages over landfill in the short term as a transition technology to, to reducing those plastics altogether. So for instance, here's one of our energy recovery facilities in Scotland. Each of these costs about um, 250 or 300 million to build. So I'm in the business of raising money in order to be able to uh, build environmental infrastructure and then I have to find an income stream that will allow me to pay back that money. So we tend to build incinerators like this on the back of long-term municipal contracts, maybe over 20 years or 30 years, which allows us to raise that 250 million pounds, build the infrastructure, deal with the problem and, and pay our investors back. An awful lot of the waste that goes into landfills still in the UK and into incinerators is uh, biogenic waste. So up to two-thirds of non-recyclable household waste collected in the UK contains short-term carbon, so it's not fossil carbon. It's uh, food waste still or, or paper or, or, something like, or stuff like that. And so, to my mind, it's better not to put that in landfill, where you've got all the problems of capturing the landfill gas uh, which is, which, uh, and, and um, preventing the conversion into methane and all the climate change disbenefits that that provides. And it's better to burn it and recover the energy. It's better still to recycle it, absolutely. But if you can't recycle it, 
then I think ERFs have a uh, energy recovery facilities have a role to play. The exact greenhouse gas savings change over time from burning waste, depending on the composition of the waste. But uh, some studies back in 2013 found that moving from landfills to ERFs would save around 8.5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, or 1.5% of the total emissions from the UK. And if you then recycle the ash, which is what we do, we turn it into building blocks, those are actually a carbon negative building product because you're, again, locking carbon in for the long term. Just talk a bit about recycling. And we are in the market of, of physical recycling. Somebody's already explained earlier on that there are emerging technologies where plastics can be uh, reduced to their organic uh, compounds uh, and then fully uh, uh, reused. But at the minute, the commercially available option is for physical recycling, and we uh, do a lot of that. Um, and just to give you some examples, a, a polypropylene pot, a yogurt pot, Substituting a ton of polypropylene with recycled polypropylene, polypropylene, if I could say it, would save nearly 1,200 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which is the equivalent of driving that material from London to Milan. So a not insignificant savings. Material is collected, as I've said, in the UK at the curbside. We don't have a deposit re uh, uh, return system at the moment, although there is a consultation out on that, and it goes to a, a facility where we sort it out. And we either sort it from the general waste or we sort it into the individual plastic components so that we can effectively uh, um, recycle it back into PET flakes or HDPE pellets or whatever the market wants as a substitute for raw materials. And that, of course, saves on the oil that's used in the first place, saves on the carbon dioxide uh, and the energy consumption. And we supply many of the leading producers like Procter & Gamble. So if you use one of their shampoos, for instance, the core of their shampoo bottle will probably be made from plastics that we have recycled. Now, this is a video. I'm kind of guessing it's not going to... Don't, don't, don't play it just... Oh, too late. It's not going to work anyway. No, fine. So I thought it might be interesting just to show you what the inside of one of these facilities looks like, because they are quite impressive. Uh, and you kind of understand why you've got to have a business model which allows for some investment before you can have one of these. So um, that's one that I went to. It's only, uh, only um, filmed on my mobile phone, so not quite up to BBC editorial standards. Uh, but it would have been nice to see the plastics whistling through that and being separa separated very effectively with very minor human intervention into the different component parts. And you can just see in the cabin at the back there are still some parts of the process where we have uh, pickers, people who literally pick stuff off the line uh, that needs taking out to ensure the purity of the material. And this plant, which is in Rochester, in Kent, in the southeast of England, achieves about 95% purity from very, very mixed uh, uh, recycled materials that come in at the front end, which is good enough to allow it to be reprocessed and put back into the supply chain. But those jobs in the picking cabin are not great jobs. Okay? The, uh, you would be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't, at the number of people that think you can put, use nappies in the recycling, and they come to us. You'd be amazed at the number of needles that come through recycling, depending on which part of the country you're in. So we do have issues with um, uh, needle pricks uh, and things like that, with all the obvious health and safety implications. And I'd love to be able to take you to this facility would be a bit of a health and safety nightmare. You'd all be wearing those green helmets that you saw in the earlier footage and the full personal protective equipment. But until you've seen them, uh, it's difficult to get an idea of the scale of, of the processes. Uh, and it's well worth a visit if you ever get to go there. Where I was going with the comment about the people and the jobs not being brilliant is as part of us looking to innovate and to remove uh, some of those and take a, uh, a wholly, you know, a sustainable view in the round. We're one of the biggest employers. We're the biggest private sector employer in the west of England. But we want decent jobs for people, not, not dodgy jobs for people. So we've recently started trials with uh, AI-driven robots to do the picking instead of uh, having individuals do it. 
The interesting thing is, at the minute, the people are much better than their robot. So there is few hope for us all uh, uh, that we won't all be put out of practice, uh, out of business by robotics. But I think we will get there as we refine the methodology. And uh, as another view of the same facility, the, the way the plastics are sorted is you have cameras that use uh, near-infrared beams that can read the type of plastic. And the plastic has to move, it has to be thinly spread over the belt and be moving at quite a pace because it has to have enough energy that it will fly over the end of the uh, belt. And then there are tiny air jets. So when the camera, for instance, if you're sorting PET from the other plastics, the camera will register an individual item of PET, an air jet then pops that piece of plastic over a weir and it's collected separately from the rest of the materials. And then you run the same process for the other plastics, which is why you see so many belts uh, and different uh, material streams, because you're, you're gradually taking out the different components, starting with stuff you don't want, like ceramics, like um, uh, metals, like nappies, like paper, like film, and, and gradually cleaning it up and, and separating it out. And it is, it is great, actually, to see them in action, which is a shame that I can't make the, the video work. But the technology, you know, is there, and it's getting better all the time. And you can return it fully into um, new products. I think just to talk again a bit, a bit about innovation, one of the things, one of the most collected types of plastics is milk bottles. Now, plastic milk bottles, uh, for some reason in the UK, people like recycling their milk bottles. A big, big amount of the plastics we receive are milk bottles. But it's very, very difficult to get rid of that smell of stale milk. And strangely enough, people like Procter & Gamble, and, uh, uh, who use our recycled plastic, don't want their posh toiletries smelling of stale milk. So we've had to innovate to find ways of deodorizing that plastic in order to be able to use it. And traditionally what you do is the recycled plastic goes in the middle of a container and then it is coated in virgin plastic to prevent the smell. But we do now have a technology uh, at one of our plants up in, in the northwest of England where you can deodorise fully that material and so it genuinely is suit, uh, a suitable and equivalent alternative to raw, uh, the virgin raw material. And, and we're starting to properly close the loop. Another really interesting uh, uh, problem is black plastics. So the marketeers will tell you that ready meals, for some reason, the consumer apparently likes, and I take our earlier conversations on this, uh, so it may not be what the consumer says, but it's what the marketeers say, that, that ready meals look better against a black plastic background. No idea if that's true. To be honest, I can't say it crosses my mind when I buy a ready meal, but apparently that is the theory. Now, the problem is because all those belts in all of those uh, um, sorting facilities are black, your optical sorter can't differentiate the black plastic from the black belt. Really simple problem. And before you suggest it, yes, of course, you could have a white belt, but then you couldn't see any of the white plastic. So maybe you could go for a blue belt. <coughs> don't know. But uh, brilliantly, we've managed to work with some uh, manufacturers of different types of equipment where as well as looking down onto the belt, the optical sorters look from the side and they can differentiate the black plastics in profile against the belt. So we can now, and I think we're the only people that can do it, can now sort out black plastic. And the thing about black plastic, as well as the foodies liking it, is once you've recycled your plastic a few times, it tends to turn into a kind of grey colour, and nobody likes grey. So one use of, uh, it prolongs the life of that plastic if you then dye it black. So black plastic is not all bad, so long as you can separate it out and find ways of doing it, like we seem to have managed to do with trialling at the moment. Sorry. So, but the issue about plastics is it takes all sorts of people to do all sorts of things. And uh, we've talked a lot today about public concern uh, and how that has risen suddenly and risen globally. And in the UK, I think it's safe to say that the industry has been moving probably almost faster than government. On the whole, I'm, I'm an ex-regulator. Uh, I'm a big fan of government intervention and regulation. But in this particular instance, uh, uh, industry and communities and NGOs and society, I think, is a little bit ahead of, of government. 
And uh, last year, something called the UK Plastics Pact was launched. We're a founder signature of that. And uh, it, it's a commitment to increase the recycling rate of plastic packaging to 70% by 2025 and make 100% of plastic packaging recyclable. And that's really important for companies like mine because unless there is a demand for the recycled plastics, then there's no investment to deliver the plants to then do the recycling. And you're in this vicious circle of not being able to raise the money, not having a good enough business plan that you can take to your bank or your investors. So something like the UK Plastic Pact, and uh, more recently the consultation the UK government has brought out to build on the circular economy package from the EU, um, is starting to look like it's going to deliver new ways of injecting life and money into the circular economy, which has been sorely, sorely missing. Another uh, thing outside Parliament. Sorry, Hugo, I should have used your, uh, your ship instead of this whale in my photo. Um, the good news is that I think that support for plastics and recycling and new measures and new taxes and new interventions is, is starting to come and it's cross-party. And that's really, really positive. And I've managed so far not to make some Brexit, but I'm going to have to, aren't I, at some point. Thank goodness the UK has at least said, regardless of what happens around Brexit and who knows where that's going, we're at least going to mirror the EU environmental regulations in the future so that the drivers for these changes and the amazing track record that being part of Europe has had for us in the UK in terms of legislation will carry on. Hugo's already mentioned, so I won't dwell on it, a new extended producer responsibility scheme, which means that those that put plastics packaging onto the market get to pay for the privilege through tax, which can then be used to invest in new materials and new facilities. You've got to have that pull for investment or nothing happens. So, what I want to do is give a bit of an insight into the practical problems of recycling and the challenges that we face in trying to make a living out of recycling because it's not always that easy. And historically, I know when I go and talk to our investors in the city of London or in Frankfurt or wherever, they regard recycling as the poor relation of our business actually, because they think it's hard to make money in that area. So we are trying to prove them wrong. We're trying to make the investments to make sure that plastics can be recycled. We recognise there's a plastics problem and change is required. And we're part of both the problem and the change that can be, as we all are in this room, I think. We don't want to be part of that problem. Uh, to give you another example from the water sector, we have a number of, in Southwest Water, a number of treatment plants that use small plastic beads as part of the treatment process. They're supposed to be in a contained bioreactor, but it's a particular sort of treatment that's particularly good if you're near the coast because it's resilient to high levels of saline, which tends to mess up more traditional water treatment processes. But they wear down, they erode, they, they do the same thing that plastic bottles do in the ocean, is they, the beads break down in smaller and smaller pieces. And before you know it, you're losing some of them to the environment. So we've decided that we need to phase these things out. And in the shorter term, we need to put extra secondary containment in to make sure that none of our bio beads get released to the environment, because in the past, we have managed to lose some. Um, so, uh, you know, things move on. That seemed like a brilliant investment decision when we were preventing the 40% of raw sewage going into the sea back in the 1990s and the 2000s. Now you look back on it and think, wish I hadn't invested all that money in something used plastic beads where I've now got to re-engineer it in order to prevent them escaping. So we are now in a program of uh, replacing those as we can. Microplastics is another really big, sorry, nearly shouted the micro, microplastics is another really big issue if you're a water company. So an awful lot of plastics pass through our treatment works and end up in the ocean. And, and there, you've got to look at solutions which are about reducing those input of plastics in the first place. So the UK government's been quite progressive and, you know, credit where credit's due. They have banned plastic beads, for instance, small microplastic beads in cosmetics and other non-essential uses. And right that they should. But I have a number of fleeces at home. Every time I wash those, they release fibres. I think the better quality your clothing, 
the less fibres they release, but not everybody can afford fantastic quality clothing. We've got to remember that. So we need action at all levels within society, not just thinking that the water company can sort out all of these things at the end of the pipe. Plastics leaking into the environment is a huge issue. But again, looking back at those graphs from earlier or those pie charts from earlier, it's not here in Western Europe. Much of that contribution to the oceans is the, in the developing world. And, and we're starting to see UK government aid now going into helping developing countries deal with plastics pollution and setting up uh, um, structures and, and, and means for collecting waste. But there's much more that needs to be done. And I think companies like mine and others like them can make a really important contribution by showing what can be done and not always on huge budgets and with huge investment. Because if we can sort these problems out in London or in Vienna or elsewhere, we can, we can help other people sort them out as well. So thank you for listening. This is a really complex issue. For me, plastics is not universally bad, but we use plenty too much of it. And we use a lot of it incredibly unnecessarily, like the ridiculous wrapped up um, um, coconut, thank you, <laughs> thing, coconut. Uh, and, and every day I see completely nonsense packaging. You know, I got something through, I'm a bit of a, uh, you know, an eBay junkie. I got something through the post the other day that was in a box almost, you know, I'm not exaggerating, half the size of this lectern, and the bit inside was about that big, the part for a car. You know, we've got to get a grip on this. But let's not, let, you know, let's not rule out recycling as a valid and important part of the overall mix, economy mix of how we deal with the plastics problem. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, so we have a few minutes uh, if you um, have time to stay and if you'd like to ask some questions from our three speakers. Um, we have a microphone ready to roam around the room. So if you'd like to put your hand up, please, if anyone's got a question, thank you very much. Uh, hi, thank you all for your uh, talks. They were very interesting and very um, inspiring. I have a question for Mr. Mitchell. Uh, you showed that uh, graph that said that a cotton bag uh, has to be reused 120 or 130 times to be as environmentally friendly as a plastic bag. How was that measured? How do you measure environmentally friendliness? Is it just carbon footprint or is it a combination of some stuff? So that was, actually there are people here from the Environment Agency who maybe might want to answer that themselves because it was their research, but it was part of a lot, it was done through life cycle assessment. So it was an attempt to look at all aspects, whether it was water use, chemical use, energy use. So, so not, just, um, not just through a plastics lens, not just about uh, climate change, but trying to look in the round. And, and, you know, life cycle assessment is a tricky business. People have made long careers out of it. Um, I, I would take the results in terms of an order of magnitude rather than with absolute precision. But, you know, I use, I use cotton shopping bags always as much as I possibly can. The problem is I don't always have them with me when I go shopping. So this is as much about people's behaviour as it is about anything else. Thank you. Uh, have we got any other questions? Um, I do, if I can jump in whilst people are thinking. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Hanley. So you've travelled around the world. You've had some incredible experiences that lots of people in the room will be very, very envious of. Um, and you've been doing this for uh, quite a long time, and you're now bringing people to now connect those with those experiences. Are there any examples where, you, where you've returned to somewhere that you've really loved and had this fantastic positive memory of, and perhaps it's been a little bit different to how you remember it? Definitely. Um, I think that um, that's one of my biggest drivers to also wanting to go back to certain places. I think we tend to have a way of traveling these days where we do things. Oh, I did Barcelona and then I you know, did the Bahamas and then I did, you know, it's especially in the US they speak that way and I, I find it very um, frustrating because when you return to a place you actually get to see 
how it's changed and what's happened. And I've seen significant changes, not only in um, pollution, which I have seen in many places, mm -hmm. unfortunately for me, many places that are very close to home along the coast of Mozambique, even within our own Cape Reserve and places that I've been visiting for over 20 years where I've seen a difference. But what really shocks me is when I see a difference in biomass deterioration or the complete lack of a species. I think that really, really scares me. Because it's one thing to go back to a beach and be like, ah, oh, crap, there's plastic. OK, let's do this, everybody. Let's pick it up. It's another thing to go back and, and say there used to be this coral head here. And I remember two families of clownfish and you know, a plate coral and um, you know, a bunch of other guys living here. And then they're gone. Or the whole coral's gone. Or you know, in the case of some shark species going back to some reefs in the Red Sea and not being able to find the sharks again. So I think for me, I get really, really down when I see um, the loss of animals and biomass. But um, like I said, I think absolute protection can start being a solution to that. We just really, really have to want it. And we really have to want to change our behavior if we want to see places remain not only as they are, but maybe even improve. And um, in the same way, you know, that um, we can't speak to <laughs> certain people about topics of economics without saying, well, if you want to make a difference, start paying your taxes. The same way we can't speak about this topic without saying, well, if you want to see the ocean protected, think about what you eat. Sometimes these decisions are difficult mm -hmm. ones, and they're the ones that are uncomfortable. And I think the more uncomfortable a decision makes, the better it is to make that decision. Because the easy ones are probably refusing a straw, fantastic. I don't think it's going to shift the needle all that much at the end of the day. But I do think that it's incredibly important to have our hearts big and open enough to care about all those things, but dare to make the uncomfortable choices. Thank you. Somebody else got a question? Thank you, David. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have a question, actually. I wanted to hear more about the circular economy. I think the last speaker mentioned uh, plans and opportunities coming up in, in the context of the EU. So I wanted to, to hear a little bit more. What kind of elements are part of the circle, of the circular economy? And do we have examples that you can bring to elaborate on that a little bit? So I think um, we're in the middle of a, a process of uh, consulting on a number of options in the UK at the minute, which are building on the circular economy package, uh, but are um, sort of distinctly uh, British in, in flavour. So, for instance, the deposit return scheme system. Um, you can argue uh, about whether we should have that universally. For me, the most important bit is that people are using a lot of plastics out and about. So people at home, on the whole, are recycling. If they're not recycling, we have the technology to sort their waste, to get the plastics out of their waste, so long as they put it in the bin. The problem is, if you're out and about, an awful lot of people are still um, buying Coke bottles or water bottles or whatever. So I'm really keen to see a deposit return scheme for out-of-household plastics. Now, potentially for in-household plastics as well, but in particular the outer household bit is a part that is uh, missing for me. And then companies like mine can recycle that and reprocess it back into plastics. But I do want to reiterate a point made earlier this afternoon for those that were in the earlier session. You can't recycle plastics indefinitely. So, you know, it, it isn't like water. Where, where water is infinitely recyclable, you get seven or eight or maybe 10 goes out of a plastic bottle and that's it. So we also do need to be reducing uh, the amount we use in the first place. I'll just, just add to that, um, um, because Ed mentioned the um, consultation on deposit return schemes and there are basically two options that the government are putting forward in the UK, which is one an on the go model, which is a very limited model um, which only captures a certain range of bottles up to a certain size. Um, and the other is a much more comprehensive model. Um, and um, we um, at Service Against Sewage have done some, uh, some studies um, of rivers and of beaches where 
actually, um, with a, a very limited on-the-go model, 58% of the bottles we find on our beaches, in our rivers, wouldn't be captured by that model. So, um, so we think a, a much more comprehensive, simple model that every bottle goes into it. And I agree, you know, recycling isn't the ultimate solution, but we need to make sure that the systems we have are, are designed to work. We've also got an extended producer responsibility um, consultation um, happening at the moment and also a taxation consultation um, which will um, make sure that we can um, tax um, plastics that aren't, um, don't contain enough recycled content. So there's a range of measures that are coming in, coming in simultaneously. So, you know, it moves in the right direction. I think, um, as I sort of finish, we need to be as radical as possible. The status quo just isn't working. Um, our household collections actually don't work very well and uh, c collecting contaminated recyclate that is often offshored. So. Thank you. Uh, did you want to ask a question now, David? Thanks. Uh, for Hugo. So, surfacing and sewage have been a fantastic pressure group in the UK for a number of years. And uh, being British, I just want to say thank you so much for the work that you guys have done over a really long period of time, uh, because the results that you've achieved um, starting out as a small group is absolutely incredible. Uh, and you should be really highly praised as an organization for that. Um, we've got a few consultations going on at the moment um, that focus on um, sort of the, the recycling methodologies and that sort of things. Do you think enough is being done at a government level to help you guys and other groups with the cleanup effort that's going on as well for the stuff that's already out there in the environment? And is there anything else that can be done at a policy level or a government level to clean up what's already there as well as stemming the flow of what's coming in? Um, it's a really good question. I, I, I actually think that um, you know, we, we, we don't take any government funding for our, our cleanups. And when we talk to lots of government ministers, we've got our all-party parliamentary group that is funded sort of separately. But we use the evidence we collect to call for the changes we want to see further upstream. You know, I, 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 I think we've got to be very careful with the sort of cleanup operation. I think too much of a focus on it in terms of community cleanups keeps the issue as a littering problem and keeps the responsibility with the public and with individuals. It's absolutely not. Um, you know, the government and industry is, is responsible for driving the change. And I think we can only signpost what we, you know, what we find at the beach. Um, you know, we're really happy and we'll carry on building the momentum of people. And every piece of plastic that we take out of the environment is a victory. But every piece of plastic we stop from being produced is a much, much bigger victory. And that's where we've got to focus efforts. And, you know, I would contest what is an industry narrative which is of the litter bug. You know, there are litter bugs, but there's just too much plastic and not enough systems to contain it at the moment. And we've got to be very careful not to try and shift the responsibility to communities and individuals and take it away from, from the people who are making massive profits at the expense of the environment at the moment. And that's, that's the facts. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. I think your hand up just behind you. Yeah, no, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, this question is for Hugo and for Hanley. Um, not to put the pressure back on you guys, you're already doing a lot of work, but um, you're obviously in the water. Your surfers are in the water, your freedivers are in the water, and you're seeing this plastic, obviously, in aggregations, probably. I wonder if um, you guys could collect that data as well. So, for example, I'm constantly trying to find in situ data around Cornwall, around Plymouth, all over the world, to match up with my satellite data to prove, to, to show these aggregations are right off our coastlines. Um, but I don't get enough in situ data. And you guys are in the water and you're seeing it all the time. I wonder if we can maybe talk later about the possibility of you guys collecting data in the water. Yeah, I mean, there is, a lot, there is data out, out there and we, we, we do have data. It depends what data you want, whether you want locations, whether you want brands, whether you want types of plastic. No, literally you know. just, we saw it. It was here this morning when so, we were yeah. surfing. And we've got plenty of data like that for, for the UK. So, so, yeah. Yeah, please, can we chat? That would be great. Yeah, I think, um, I think you bring up a, a good point, which is the need for collaboration because I do feel that there's a lot of both data and 
both hard but also anecdotal data that sometimes would be much stronger when shared. And I think in uh, the nonprofit sector in general, sometimes in research, definitely in ocean conservation, there's a need for collaboration. I think that's one of the greatest gaps that exists. And so, for sure, I mean, if there's any way we can help, even though it's not always for extended periods, they, I, we always try to work with, with scientists in different regions, but again, I think so much of that communication happens in silos, and then sometimes there's also a kind of a protection of information, because sometimes information is also a currency, and I think that is stopping us from actually reaching change and solutions quicker than sharing information and collaborating more. Just to end, too, just sort of broadly, that, you know, in... in in the UK, particularly in the southwest, on our, our western-facing beaches, it's, it's pretty clear where the plastic washes up. We, 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 know, we know the beaches that are most effective, and it's often the, 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 they're facing the prevailing winds and the prevailing currents, and that's, that's where we're finding the plastic. So actually, I'm sure the same is, is true in, in most territories, that there are the, the, the sort of accumulator spots for plastic. And those will sort of always be the case whilst plastic is there. You know, of course, they vary a bit if there's a, a, a shift in weather, but the prevailing weather will always sort of drive it into the same places. The beach I showed in my, in my um, presentation, Perrinporth, the north end of that beach, Penhale Corner, is a magnet for plastic pollution. That's where there is always plastic pollution. I've done dozens of beach cleans. I've mobilised thousands of volunteers there over my years, and it will always, it will always be the case until we stop the flow. Thank you. And I think that's a really nice way to end the session, actually, about the importance of working with scientists to really communicate that science and then use that to drive communities, etc. So thank you for that question. Uh, we're out of, out of time now. Um, if every, anyone is around tomorrow evening, there'll be a screening of a plastic ocean. I think it's in the room next door. E2, whichever one way that is. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your conference.